So, who is behind trying to deselect you? Len Paxton and all that mob. You know what they're like. They're a waste of calories, most of them. But old Red Len, I thought he was your biggest supporter. Truss and braces rolled into one. He was till I got elected. He's my biggest enemy now. He can't be, surely. Not while I'm still around. <laughs> Doesn't do any good, all this internal squabbling. The right purging the left, the left purging the right. It's not a party anymore. It's an emetic. So on what grounds are they trying to get rid of you? They don't think I'm radical enough. Oh, radical enough? What about your income tax protest? Well, that was only recently, wasn't it? But you were the biggest radical in the party. You were so red, remember, they used to call you Pillarbox Price. Well, <laughs> they may have called me Pillarbox Price when I got elected. I'm Pillar of Society Price now in Paxton's eyes. Well, what's he after, then? He wants the nomination. Why does everyone want to be an MP? Well, where else can mediocrities without talent find an outlet for their ambitions? <laughs> Thank you, Geoffrey. I meant him, not you. Do you think he'll get you deselected? I won't let him. I'm going to fight. Perhaps you could help. Get my supporters to rally round. Yes, certainly. Mind you, it's a bit difficult to rally all on your own. <laughs> ah, there you are, Jean. Time for a quick one, have you? Uh, what about? About certain income tax protests. Nuclear weapons, I heard. No, honestly, Norman, I haven't got any. I handed them in with my overdue library books. I heard you were taking a stand, withholding your income tax and encouraging others to do likewise. That's quite right, yes. I am withholding that part of my income tax that goes on nuclear weapons, and I am recommending that my constituents do the same. Well, have you no shame, woman? Since when has this been official Labour Party policy? Didn't we agree at conference we were abandoning unilateralism and that nuclear weapons were now a good thing? A good thing? Well, maybe not a bad thing. And let's not forget, Jean, they've kept the peace for over 50 years. Where, Norman? In Iraq, for example? Well, maybe not Iraq, but Budley Salterton's been quiet. I have never made any secret of my views. Oh, yes, well, you don't need to tell me that. But if you did uh, keep them to yourself, I don't think we'd blame you. I have always been against nuclear weapons and pro-disarmament. Well, we're as committed to disarmament as ever, Jean. It's not that we won't get rid of nuclear weapons. We will. We'd just like to wait until it's safe to do so. And when will it be safe to do so? When everyone else gets rid of theirs. And when is that likely to be? When we get rid of ours, probably. <laughs> and that, Norman, is why I am withholding my income tax. Oh, I see. And the threat of deselection in your constituency by your militant brethren would have no connection with your taking a well-publicised left-wing stand, would it? That's the thing I like about you, the way you can always see the worst in everyone. Well, they gave me the job as whip, Jean, and the view came with it. Excuse me. <laughs> Good morning, Mrs. Price. Back again? Yes, no rest for the wicked, eh? No. Oh, uh, talking of whom, is he in? Well, no, it's... <laughs> Goffrey, stop playing with your portfolio. I want a word with you about... Oh. Yes, may I be of any assistance? I'm sorry, this is Godfrey Egan's office, isn't it? Ah, yes, poor Godfrey. Shame, shame. What do you mean, poor Godfrey? My impression was that it was always filthy rich, Godfrey. <laughs> well, yes, it was, but such is life on the top board, you have to take a dive sooner or later. Yeah, Jean Price, isn't it? I've seen her in the chamber. Yeah. Richard Monkton, isn't it? I've seen you in the bar. <laughs> yes. I'm not really a great chamber man, I'm afraid. I find the commons, like most chambers, involves an awful lot of effort with very meagre result. So, uh, where is Godfrey? Is he indisposed? And more disposed of, really. He's sort of gone into temporary exile. Did the burdens of office get too much for him? No, it was more the burdens of his credit cards. <laughs> I believe he was out servicing alone, and the jack gave way and his overdraft fell on top of him. <laughs> he sustained severe financial injuries and will be in economic traction for some time. So he's lying low? Well, recuperating, yes. It's been a bad summer. BCCI, Lloyd's... I'm surprised at Goffrey getting bitten. He's always struck me as a very smooth operator. Goffrey is positively Vaseline in many ways. <laughs> I mean, he's not totally ruined, but, uh, well, if he hadn't had access to his client's money, things could have been a lot worse. <laughs> so, uh, where is he now? I believe it's usually described as abroad. I don't have the address myself. Well, he might at least have phoned me. I think he scarcely had time to put his trousers on. <laughs> there is a letter for you. Oh, thank you. This is all very inconvenient. Mm -hmm. I mean... We were paired. There's a two-line whip tonight, and I'd already arranged something. Oh, no, uh, Jean, that's, that's perfectly all right. No, you don't need to worry about finding another pair. You're mine now. Says who I'm yours? It explains in the letter. Uh, Godfrey sold you to me, along with his office. 
That is, I haven't entirely paid for you yet, but I've certainly put down a substantial deposit. He has got no right to sell me. Now, I paid good money for you, Jean. I was told you were an extremely reliable pair, prompt and punctual, and I do hope I haven't been deceived. How much did he sell me for? Need that concern you, Jean. It was a private transaction. It concerns me if you want this pairing arrangement to continue. I want 20%. <laughs> You've no idea where he's gone, have you, Harry? I've all this confounded mail for him, you see. Well, I do have a sort of address for him, sir. Oh, really? It's P.O. Box 543, the Cayman Islands, sir. <laughs> Thank you very much, Harry. If you mark that care a lucky Luke, and I believe it'll get to him eventually. <laughs> Sorry, care of who, did you say? It's a damn cheap. Godfrey had no business selling me off. If I wasn't so busy with this deselection thing, I'd go and find someone else to pair with. Look at this. It's from my constituency. My presence is not requested at the memorial service on Remembrance Day. That's charming, eh? Why not? Oh, it's because of what I said about the Gulf War. My views were not wholly appreciated. All the same, if there is going to be a memorial service, I should be there. Question of paying your respects. So everyone can see you paying them? As a local MP, <laughs> I ought to be there. Yes, but you did actually oppose military intervention, didn't you? In fact, you were still speaking against them going six months after they came home. Stop the point. I can still appreciate what it took to go out there. I see, and the fact that you're under threat of deselection for being too far left and militant would have absolutely nothing to do with it. I am not militant. I'm a pacifist. <laughs> yeah, a militant pacifist. What about you, anyway? You're being threatened with deselection for not being left-wing enough. You, who once wore a duffel coat. You know, Jean, it's uh, hard to credit looking at you now. You once had a beard and sandals. I shaved the sandals off, Ken. I thought it made me look younger. <laughs> anyway, mine isn't a serious challenge. I'm not worried about Len Paxton and people like that. No, nor am I. They don't bother me, these sort of people. I've got nothing to worry about, nothing to fear. I can always do other things. <laughs> I think. I've decided to continue with the pairing arrangement. What happened? Did you forget to put the top on the blender? I was addressing the students' union on the subject of free speech. Oh? And they're against it. <laughs> Look at it, it's ruined. Well, that's the last time I address a woman's college. When I'm asked around for dinner, I don't expect to have it thrown at me. Well, you must have said something to provoke them. Not at all. I simply outlined Tory party policy. Well, there you are, then. What can you expect? They were there in force with their banners. Women for peace, they called themselves. In fact, I wonder whether you knew anything about them, Jean, being a bit of a conscientious. How can I be a conscientious objector? I haven't had my call-up papers. Well, you seem to object to everything fairly conscientiously. I object to my income tax going on nuclear warheads right enough. Oh, yes, I heard about your non-payment campaign, now, will you? No, I can't stop. Well, as far as these women for peace are concerned, these scrawny old broilers in boiler suits, I mean, if it wasn't for MPs like myself fighting defence cuts, they wouldn't be safe in their halls of residence, or free to take out a student's loan. And you know that some of these women, as they're rather inaccurately described, even chain themselves to the bumper of my BMW. <laughs> really? Yes. No respect for property. There was the most horrendous racket when I drove off. <laughs> the jolly good job for them, they let go before I got to the motorway. <laughs> women for peace, indeed. I mean, have you heard of them before, Jean? I mean, it's obviously some paramilitary organisation. Uh, no, sorry, Richard. Though I can quite understand their feelings. I mean, the Cold War is over, you know. Maybe some people feel we deserve to award ourselves a peace dividend. Jean, the Reds may not be under the bed like they used to be, but we don't know what they left behind them on the carpet. <laughs> and there are always threats from elsewhere, but thanks to these defence cuts, a lot of people in my constituency will now be out of a job. Oh, well, we'd better go on killing people then if it's work for the unemployed. We have to think of the balance of payments, Jean, and it is no use being wishy-washy. How can a liberal democracy expect to survive without a, a fully trained, highly equipped army of killers ready to defend it? But after the way I've been treated today, well, these women think they're going to get my money to help them bring the country to its knees. They are wrong. No. I'm going to take a leaf off your tree, Jean. I'm refusing to pay my income tax. What? The bit that goes on nuclear weapons? No, the bit that goes on gynaecology. <laughs> If I can't have my military operations, they can't have their medical ones. Good morning. Uh, Jean, uh, excuse me. Uh, may I ask what that is in your lapel? This? Oh, good heavens, it's a lobster. <laughs> it looks suspiciously like a commemorative pop to me. Yes, so it is. 
There's no doubt about it, you're a real Richard Sharp Eyes. I may not agree with your political views, but you're red hot on botany. Then may I ask a self-appointed custodian of the national honour and what you're doing wearing one? Remembrance Sunday, Richard. Why are you wearing yours? Ah, yes, but I don't know if it's a sort of peacenik you should be wearing one at all, should you? Why? What are you supposed to do before you're allowed to wear a poppy? Demonstrate proficiency in the martial arts? Go down the road and kick someone's teeth in? No, but uh, one does have to have certain, well, entitlements to wear one of these. I mean, I pay my share of the defence budget. My whole share, unlike some. Richard, my father came home from the Second World War with two pounds of shrapnel in his leg and three pounds of medals on his chest. I am more than entitled to wear a poppy. I am entitled to grow opium. Gee, I'm so sorry. I had no idea you were the wayward child of good conservative stock. I'm nothing of the sort. My father was a lifelong member of the Communist Party. Oh, I see. But when you mentioned shrapnel in the leg, I thought you meant that the Germans had shot it. It was the Allies, was it? The Communists were our allies. Were they? Good heavens. So they were. Isn't it funny how one forgets? Oh, well, war and adversity. They bring a man strange, trench fellows. And I resent the assumption, Richard, that the defence of the realm is purely in the hands of the Tory party. Now, I'm not trying to underplay anyone's achievement, Jean. It's just that one must not forget that battles are still lost and won on the playing fields of Eton. Yes, and it's still people from the comprehensives who get used as the footballs. <laughs> Morning. Freddie? Mm -hmm. What is that in your buttonhole? It's a rose. Drew it myself. It's a Thatcher. No, 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 Freddie. <laughs> Haven't you had the directive from Central Office? All red roses to be sprayed with weed killer. Sacrifices have to be made. Oh, well, uh, what about my Union Jack boxer shorts? Is it all right to go on wearing those? Only in Benadon, Freddie. Only in Benadon. <laughs> Pardon me saying so, sir. Bit of an idiot, that one, sometimes. Ah, yes. But there are a lot of idiots in the country, you see, Harry. And they're entitled to some representation. <laughs> Good morning, Jean. Good morning. You're looking very nice. Why? What's wrong with me? No, nothing. No, you're looking very nice. Very smart outfit. That kind of thing never dates, does it? However often you wear it. <laughs> There's no doubt about it, you're a real craftsman with the well-turned compliment, Norman. You can almost hear the lathe creaking. Well, some people never find the way to a woman's heart, Jean. Others of us, we bought them up. Look, if it's about withholding my income tax, I'm not going to change my mind. No, nothing like that. Nothing about bad publicity, doing untold harm. Anyway, it's no good coming the heavy pressure with you, is it? All boots for tough, isn't it? Nice of you to say so, Norman. Yes, just makes you more determined. That's the way you are. No, you've, you've been with us now quite a while, aren't you? I mean, you're not the new girl anymore, all awkward and gangly, and what shall I do with my hand? No, it's three years now. Is it really? You don't look a day older. Three long years up there in the back benches, eh? You know, some of us were wondering if a woman of your undoubted talent wasn't wasted up there in the gods. <laughs> and we were wondering if it wasn't time for you to take a step or two up by taking a few steps down the gangway. What, you mean the front... Oh, how flattering. You mean the front bench? What position? Well, knowing your interest in women's issues, we thought something like spokeswoman for women at work. We thought of you as chair. Me? Chair? Well, you could even be table if you'd rather. <laughs> you play your cards right, Jean, you could end up as an entire set of furniture. Well, I must say I'm very flattered, Norman. The front bench. Oh, there are people who've been here longer than me. Or to the talents of the trades, Jean. Cream always rises to the top. <laughs> well, do the eyes have it, then? Well, yes, Norman, thank you. Good to have you on board. Oh, uh, there is just one thing, Jean. As, uh, as a spokeswoman for the party, you'll be confining your public comments to your own areas of responsibility. Oh, yes, of course. I certainly won't overlap onto anyone else's territory. I don't want to go treading on anyone's toes. No, it's just politeness, really. So you won't be making any pronouncements on, uh, like, expenditure or fiscal matters. And you won't be seen to be breaking the laws of the land by withholding your income tax, will you? All right, I'll see you then, Jean. Just a minute, Norman. Just a minute. Oh, something we've overlooked, is there? You're just trying to shut me up, aren't you? 
You're just trying to buy me off with some totally bogus and useless job to stop me speaking my mind about defence. Well, I don't know whatever gave you that idea. Well, you're not sticking your bung in my barrel. Well, I wasn't trying to do anything of the sort. It's just the conditions that come with the job. Well, thanks for the appointment, Norman. I enjoyed working with you tremendously. I will undoubtedly miss all my colleagues on the front bench. Nevertheless, I resign. Well, you can't resign. You've only been in a job for 35 seconds. I accomplished a lot in a short time. <laughs> Silence is golden, Norman. You don't buy it that cheap. Trouble at Pitt, Norman, is it? <laughs> I don't know what she thinks she looks like in that silly outfit, do you? <laughs> so you'll be in your constituency if I remember on Sunday, will you, Richard? Yes, I should probably be popping along. Are you, Freddie? Yes, yes. Just wanted to ask, though, etiquette-wise, mm -hmm. uh, regimental ties, is it, do you think? Oh, I should think so, yes. What was your regiment, by the way? Was it the Guards? Squad is, actually. Ah, oh, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, there you are. And how's the non-payment coming along? Oh, fine, thank you, Richard. And yours? Oh, it's rolling along nicely. In fact, I'm hoping that the uh, revenue will get the bailiffs in, actually. Give me the opportunity to make a stand. As in well-publicised, you mean? To show I'm not standing for it. And have the bailiffs come for you yet? No, not yet. But I have had the court judgment and the cough-up or else letters. Good. And do you intend to expect to it? No. I'll go to jail first. How much do you owe, exactly, Richard? Well, um... The tax I'm withholding, Jean, which I've calculated to be the portion of my money wasted on gynaecology, amounts to, uh, one pound and ninepence. <laughs> one pound and ninepence? No, obviously, that's just a scalp figure off the top of my head. So all your protest is worth is one pound and ninepence. What difference is that going to make? You couldn't even get a vasectomy for one pound and ninepence. <laughs> yes, you could if you did it yourself. <laughs> It is a totally meaningless protest, Richard. Not at all. Anyway, it's not the money, it's the principal. One pound and nine pence. Well, what does your nuclear defence non-payment amount to? Oh, about a couple of hundred pounds. Well, what's the MOD going to get for 200 pounds? Roman candle and a packet of sparklers? It is the principal, not the amount. Precisely. So why shouldn't what applies to your principles apply to mine? Well, if all your principles are worth is one pound and nine pence, they're not worth much. Well, it just annoys me, that's all. These women calling me a warmonger. I mean, look at Bodicea, she was a woman. Knives on her chariot wheels to cut her enemies' legs off. But there you are, you see, Jean. What? Women drivers. <laughs> well, I'm just going anyway. Yes, I would. Whether they want me there or not. And I'm going to put my wreath on the cenotaph. Quite right, too. They're not going to stop me, you know. I mean, if all these councillors and the rest are getting to lay a wreath, then I should get to lay one, too. I mean, is my wreath as good as their wreath, or isn't it? Well, I'm sure it is, Ken. In fact, it's probably better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what is the matter with everyone? Bringing politics into Remembrance Day. Trying to capitalise on the sorrows of the world. They don't give a damn about folk. They just want to be in the viewfinder when the bulbs start flashing. Oh, but you won't want that, of course. No. No, I'm staying well out of it, Jean. And it's all so distasteful, isn't it? But you don't have to be a war supporter to attend a memorial service. I'm going there as a representative of peace. It's a witch hunt. That's all it is. Well, they're just looking for scapegoats. Well, I'd just better be allowed to put down my wreath and pay my respects at this peace and remembrance ceremony, that's all. Because if I am not... What? There's going to be trouble, Jimmy. <laughs> I thought you said the bailiffs weren't allowed to just walk into your house and cart off your valuables. No, they're not, unless you invite them in. I didn't cart off your valuables, they carted off mine. So why did you invite them in? I didn't invite them in. How could I? I wasn't even here. It was our ever-obliging cleaning lady who let them in and then helped them to clear us out. But why? She didn't want us getting into trouble. She even helped them to carry out the cast-iron saucepans. <laughs> just a minute. I don't believe it. They've got my fish brick. <laughs> uh, well, that's Sunday dinner gone. You want something to eat, you'll have to go down to the auctions. I didn't want the bailiffs taking goods for the unpaid tax. I wanted to make a stand on this. I was at least looking forward to going to prison for a couple of days. Oh, uh, were you? What about me? How come I never get a break? So what did they take apart from the pans? I can't see anything missing. What did they take? I'll tell you what they took. They took my golf clubs. Oh, well, nothing of any value, then. <laughs> At least nothing we can't live without. Yeah, I bet you wouldn't be saying that if they'd taken your hair dryer. Listen, I've got a game on Saturday. All right, if it keeps the peace, how much is a set of new ones? 
Well, like the ones they took, 800 pounds. All right, if it keeps the peace, how much is a set of second-hand ones? <laughs> I'll let you know. Right. Um, Jeff, after the bailiffs came, you didn't by any chance phone the local newspaper, did you? No. Why would I? I thought you said you never wanted them round here again. Yeah, but with this deselection and everything, I mean... Len Paxton's never had the bailiffs in, has he? Oh. Well, that was disgraceful, Ken. It really was. They showed the whole thing on the news. I wasn't just ashamed to be a member of the same party. I was ashamed to be a member of the same species. Look, it wasn't my fault. The Tory councillor trod in my wreath. There was a big hush puppy imprint all over my dedication card. And I was deliberately jostled. They were trying to stop me getting to the front to pay my respects. You were supposed to be there to commemorate past battles, not to reenact them. It was an act of deliberate provocation and sabotage. Well, deliberate or not, it was no excuse for what you did to his poppy. That wasn't me, it was a pigeon. Ah. <laughs> so who need him in the groin? Was that a pigeon too? No, that was a Liberal Democrat. They can't get proportional representation, so they take it out in other people's cobblers. <laughs> It was shocking, Ken. It really was. And if I was one of your constituents, I would be rooting for your deselection too. Funnily enough, it doesn't seem to have had that effect. I'm a bit of a local hero up there now. Could hardly get out of the pub for people buying me drinks. Oh? Yeah, they seem to think I've evened up the score for the Highland clearances. <coughs> Hello, Ken Miller. Oh, you saw that, did you? Yeah, yeah, I was. I was giving away a few pounds there, but... Uh, I did a wee bit of boxing when I was at school. <laughs> no, no, just tell your lad to send me his autograph book. That'll be fine. It's my fans. <laughs> Morning, Harry. Morning, sir. Saw you at the memorial service, sir. Your little encounter with Women for Peace. Oh, good, yes. Andy with her knees, that one, sir, wasn't she? <laughs> but she's quite a cruncher, eh? Me and the missus couldn't help but laugh. <laughs> good, I'm glad you enjoyed it, Harry. We used to find the force a packet of frozen peas was the thing. Good, I'll, uh, I'll give it a try. Thank you. Excuse me. Morning, Richard. How are you? Bet you wish you paid your bit to gynaecology now. <laughs> ah, Jean, how's the deselection challenge going then? How are things amongst the deselect few? And with one bound, she was free, Norman. Oh, you've seen him off then? Oh, Red Lynn Paxton. Oh, yes, I remember him from student days. We were in the students' union together. He used to invite conservative politicians to address meetings and then pelt them with tomatoes. <laughs> no, you can't beat students for originality, can you? So how did you see him off, then? It was no contest. He's never had the bailiffs in, not like me. Oh, yes, hard to compete with radical credentials like that. So are you going to be with us a while longer, then? I hope so, Norman, yes. You're going to be quite a seasoned campaign or one of the old war horses. Well, it's that all knackered. Yeah. <laughs> Well, pacifists and warmongers, hawks and doves, it's all really irrelevant here, isn't it, Jean? Irrelevant? Oh, yes. You want to stay in Parliament, Jean. Doesn't matter what you believe in. You still have to be a fighter, don't you? All right, just the one. But watch it. <laughs> It was just one thing after another, really, Mrs. Price. I mean, taking out the mortgage, we was putting ourselves on the rack. Then with the poll community rate council charge tax at the time. No, that wasn't the bet, no. No, it was envelopes with windows every post. 
And then a second baby come along and Jan had to give up her job. Well, we couldn't expect her to go on working. Not when she suffered so badly with morning sickness. No. No, not in the hairdressers. People don't like to listen to it, do they? Not right next to the basin. <laughs> well, that was when you took out the second loan, was it? Well, I had to, Mrs. Price. I wasn't in a position. The same with the credit cards. All sort of Peter and Paul with a visa and access. Yes, well, couldn't you have got some advice earlier? Maybe from one of the debt counselling agencies? No, there, there was one near us, but they overspent their grant. <laughs> and then Jan's mum fell ill, and my dad died, and her brother had the accident, and then there was the fire. <laughs> and I expect you read about the cat in the paper. Oh, that was yours? Yeah. <laughs> Even then, we might have kept our heads above water if I hadn't got made redundant. But couldn't you at least have paid the interest on the mortgage? Well, I tried, Mrs. Price, but with two kids and the vet's bills, other things had to come first. I mean, I even had some gas shares, but I had to sell them to pay the electric. So, <laughs> so they finally repossessed the house? Yeah, they put us out on Tuesday. Oh, it's incredible, really. Eighteen months ago, we had a house, a future, we could take a holiday. Now what have we got? All we've got left's the car. Oh, well, that must be worth something. Couldn't you sell that and use the money? Sell it, Mrs. Price. We're living in it. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah, that reminds me. You wouldn't have some change, would you? And I've left it out in a metre. <laughs> They're living in a car? What, four of them? What sort of car is it? An old Cortina. Well, how do they wash them and stay warm? I don't know. They huddle around the cigarette lighter, I suppose. <laughs> it is terrible. Family with young children living in a car in this day and age. So what are you going to do about it? Not that easy, is it? I mean, house repossession due to mortgage arrears. In the eyes of the council, you've made yourself intentionally homeless. Which means, as you know, they're not obliged to rehouse you. Now, do I put pickle in this one? Hang on. Is that for the bloke in the old fridge freezer box? Um, no, it's for the woman with the trolley. No, she has mayonnaise. <laughs> oh, and that bloke with the tartan blanket wasn't too happy with his soup last night, you know. Why not? You forgot his croutons. <laughs> I know they're living in a car, but they aren't the only homeless people in the constituency. But they do have two kids, Jean. Surely the junior section of the homeless take priority. But I can't help people to queue jump. If I do that, what are the other 5,000 on the waiting list going to say? I'll just have to lean on the housing department a bit, apply a little discreet pressure. What sort of discreet pressure? Sort of tourniquet around the neck. <laughs> Morning, Norman. Morning, George. Norman. Oh, Gino, sorry. My mind was drifting. Oh, if you could be pithy, I got a lot in the file of facts. But I wanted a quick word with you about sleeping arrangements, actually. You've already got a husband, haven't you? What's wrong with him? Sleeping arrangements, Norman, not snoring arrangements. Sleeping? Oh, you mean in the chamber, do you? Oh, well, we'd rather you didn't nod off in there. It doesn't look good now the cameras are in. I don't know if you saw Sydney the other day, did you? Oh, I should have used his hanky, really. <laughs> I mean, people will go off and vote Tory out of sheer disgust. Yes. Not sleeping arrangements in the chamber, Norman. I mean on the embankment. Oh, yes. Terrible problem, that. I mean, you go for a quiet walk along by the river, you're up to your shins in dossers. They're not dossers. They're homeless. Well, when I said dossers, I didn't mean it pejoratively. Some of my best friends here are dossers. Very sad. Well, I'm going to try and do something to help all the homeless on the embankment. Why is that, then? It's not Christmas, is it? The homeless don't come round once a year, Norman. They are with us all the time. So, I am organising an all-party sleep-out to draw attention to their situation, and I wondered if I could put your name down. Oh, yes. Yeah. Sleep-out, you mean... like in a sleeping bag? In the cold, on the hard pavement out there all night? <laughs> yes. Yes, well, I'd love to, really, Jean, but you see, the thing is that one in three people do suffer from them, and cold paving slabs aren't the best remedy. You can bring an extra blanket, then, and your thermal underwear. Oh, I was having a bit of trouble with the flap, actually. <laughs> Norman, I have got 12 Tories pledged to sleep out, and only eight from the Labour Party. And as we're supposed to be the party who cares, I think some of us had better start being seen to be caring. Yes, well, you better put my name down, then. Rally round the cause, eh? Keep the homeless fires burning. Think of all those lost votes, Norman. If we could only get the homeless to register. Oh, we tried that once, Jean. We had a big campaign to get the uh, homeless on the electoral roll. Sent them all letters, you know. Letters to the homeless? Yes, wasn't one of my best ideas. Oh, I'd be delighted well, to I come along. I know it doesn't yes, sound all that comfortable, Richard, but what? I said, yes, I'd be delighted to come along. Little snooze on the embankment, sausage in a bun. Sounds quite jolly, really. Like being back in the core. 
I'd hardly describe lying on the embankment as a jolly night out. Have you ever actually slept rough? I may not have slept rough to you, but I've certainly been awake rough. <laughs> and it's a very serious thing, the numbers of people sleeping out on the streets. Certainly hit the bed manufacturers. <laughs> well, you think of it, Jean, for every person sleeping rough, there's an unsold duvet and a couple of pillows. <laughs> Though I do feel that some of them are on the lines of sturdy beggars. I mean, a lot of them could work if they wanted to. Oh, and it's so easy to get a job when you're homeless, Richard. You just sit there in your cardboard box and your cardboard phone never stops ringing. But it's not that the accommodation isn't there, Jean. They don't have to be in cardboard boxes. So what should they do instead? Spin cocoons and hang on the wall? <laughs> Look, one of the reasons there are so many homeless is because your lot sold off all the council houses. Yes, but it was the Labour Party that killed off the private sector with all these tenants' rights and tribunals. No wonder that nobody wants to be a landlord. Trying to get a tenant out is like trying to eat winkles without a pig. I'll put your name down, Richard, and I'll let you know about the dates. Yes, if you would. And uh, you think this will attract plenty of publicity, do you? Uh, for the homeless, of course. <laughs> and I'm sorry to bother you again, Mrs. Price, but we keep getting moved on. It's like getting a bit crucial. Yeah, well, I have been on to the housing department, but it's a major accomplishment just to get them to answer the phone. It seems there's nowhere we can go. We don't get harassed. We even tried down by the hospital one night, thinking it'd be quiet, but the ambulances kept us awake. I am doing my best. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's just four of us in a car. We don't get much sleep, nor much privacy. Everyone's always peeking in, asking if you want to borrow a set of jump leads. But, I mean, there's nowhere to go. It's double yellows everywhere. Well, couldn't you park further out? Out of the neighbourhood? I live here, Mrs. Price. This is my home. At least where we're parked, we're handy for schools and amenities. Otherwise, we'd have to commute. We'd spend hours a day in the car, then. With respect, Terry, you were offered temporary hostel accommodation. Yeah, but they might want to split us up. It's all we've got left now, each other. I mean, I am trying to hold the family together. I might be holding it together in an old banger, but I am holding it together. Traffic warden come in. He was getting his notebook out. Oh, no, I'd better go look. Well, uh, I'll get on to the council again. Terry, where will you be for the rest of the day? I'll be parked outside Dixon's till five. The kids want to see the football. <laughs> then we'll spend the night in the paying display. It's free overnight. Thanks for your help. Excuse me. Cheers. <coughs> Kathy, come home, eh? That was 20 years ago, Robert. It's all changed since then. Has it? Yeah. It's Kathy get lost now. <laughs> oh, Richard. Yes, Reddy? Uh, this embankment thing, are you bivouacking out for the night? Oh, I think I should probably participate. Worthy cause and all that, haven't you? Well, I thought it might attract a bit of publicity. To the homeless? Who? <laughs> Them, yes. Thing is, long night, though, apt to get rather peckish. Now, I thought I might ring up Harris if you care to come in on a hamper, bit of pate, bottle of shampoo. <laughs> Freddie, the last time we split a hamper, I paid for it and you ate it. <laughs> do I still owe you for that? Yes, you do. Excuse me. <laughs> Sorry to bother you here, Mr. Miller, but I don't really know anyone else. You don't actually know me either, do you, Craig? No, but, well, you're my MP. And I've been on the streets since I've got here. It's really rough. And I've not got a job. I see. So you left home, came to London on a single ticket, no job to go to, nowhere to stay, and not known a soul. I must say, I admire your initiative. I was only getting on my bike, Mr. Miller. Ah, well, you should have tried a shorter journey. Well. <laughs> What's at home with it all closed down, eh? Even the unemployed have been made redundant. <laughs> What's to stay for? A bedroom. Your mum and dad, have you told them you're here? Aye, I was meaning to get in touch, but I couldn't find a shop that sold the phone cards. I mean, you were lucky to get this far, you know? You were lucky to get out of Euston Station without a needle in your arm and somebody's hand down your trousers. I can look after myself. <laughs> and who's going to look after you while you're doing it? OK, Craig, I'll do you a favour. Got something here I always keep handy for visiting constituents like yourself. Is that a sub, Mr Miller? No. It's one of the best things ever to come out of England. A bus ticket back to Scotland. <laughs> Leaves Victoria at two o'clock, and you've got time to phone your mum. Oh, thanks. Don't you think you were a bit hard on him? Hard? Me? That was Mr. Nice Guy. <laughs> ah, Jean. Ah, Richard. Look, I was thinking earlier this morning. Oh, I didn't realise that today was your turn with the Tory party brain cell. <laughs> well, even one brain cell would amount to more than the collective wisdom of the Labour Party. So, you were thinking, Richard? I was struggling to find a way in which to help the homeless. And have you thought of a foolproof scheme yet of making money out of them? 
<laughs> it just seems to me, Jean, so anomalous that we have all this property standing empty in the city. What property, exactly? Well, all these uh, office blocks built during the property boom. 90 pounds a square foot, now you can't get threepence a yard for it. Richard, we are looking for somewhere to put the homeless, not somewhere to stack desks and filing cabinets. Yes, but uh, you see, Jean, with a little judicious expenditure, these empty offices could easily be turned into accommodation. In fact, I am myself on the board of a company with the odd smoke glass, high-rise sort of thing. Mm, you astonish me. I never realised you were interested in making money. I just like to keep busy. But the point is, you see, Jean, if the conditions were right, we'd be willing to go ahead with implementing a conversion scheme of this nature. What conditions? What is it exactly that you, as a property developer, want to do with the homeless? Well, we thought it might be rather a good idea if uh, we could write them off against tax. <laughs> Nothing like making money out of other people's misfortunes. Jean, if we stop making money out of other people's misfortunes, the entire economy will grind to a halt. <laughs> Only split the family up. And what's that going to cost? Eight hundred pounds a month. Their mortgage was only three hundred. It's a mystery, home economics. Mystery? It's an absurdity. The council will pay eight hundred pounds a month to put the homeless up, yet not pay three hundred to stop them becoming homeless. They'd have saved themselves five hundred. Why couldn't they do that? They can't afford it, I suppose. And the other ridiculous thing is, their own house, the one they were evicted from, is now standing empty. Why is that then? Building society can't sell it. The market's too depressed. You mean this family has been evicted from a house which is now standing empty, and while the house is standing empty, they're living in a car, and you're trying to find them council accommodation? Yes. Well, what kind of nonsense is that, then? It's a housing policy. <laughs> but, but while this couple's house is standing empty, but the price has gone down, why don't they buy it back again? I suggested that it's no good. Why not? He can't get a mortgage. Why not? He hasn't got a job. I found him one, but they wouldn't take him on. Why not? He's homeless. <laughs> I think I'll have a couple of dispring when I go back to the office. I wouldn't bother, Norman. By the time you've taken enough, you've taken too many. <laughs> what, your wife? Yeah, and both the kids about half an hour ago. I mean, it was bad enough when they clamped it, but getting your family towed away. Well, I don't want to criticise, Terry, but why did you ever leave it there? I didn't leave it, Mrs Price. I ran out of petrol. And if you want to know the truth, I went down the road with a can and a length of hose looking to steal some. Because that's how I've been keeping us moving this last week. Siphoning petrol? Oh, come on now, Terry. You shouldn't be doing that. Yeah, I know. It's not good for your lungs. <laughs> and everyone's got locking petrol caps these days. You don't know if you're getting unleaded or what. It's not just that. It is dishonest. Dishonest? I'm living in a car and you're talking about honest. You won't be any good to your family if you get arrested. And you can't ask two kids to go on living in a car. What sort of effect is it having on them? Yeah, well, it is difficult for them to have friends round. And we've had to cancel the exchange visit. Where's the car now? It's in the car pound. I mean, I've explained the situation, but they say it doesn't make any difference. We still have to pay to get it out. And of course I haven't got it. Joke, eh? Perhaps I should take a mortgage out in a car. How much? Oh, Mrs Price, I couldn't ask you. I'm not necessarily offering. Come on, I'll give you a lift. If I could just find somewhere to park it, you say, it wouldn't be so bad. I know how you feel about it, Jeff. You don't have to say. I know we agreed, no more hard luck stories. We still keep hearing them, though, don't we? I know you're tired of having people in the house, and I don't blame you at all. I'm sure it's very commendable, you saving all these people from being put down. Look, I know you've tolerated an awful lot, but really, they'll be gone before you know it. Couldn't be gone before they get here, could they? <laughs> and how am I going to get the car out with them living in the driveway? Oh, you'll move it. You only have to ask. It'll only be for a few days. I'm going down to the council on Monday with a set of earbenders and I won't stop till they cry for mercy. Now, they'll be in to use the bathroom and to make breakfast. Other than that, they have got strict instructions to stay in the car. Yes, Jean. So you won't be bothered? No, I won't be bothered. I'll go to bed tonight and sleep with a clear conscience, thinking of those two kids trying to sleep on the back seat of an old Cortina. And there's jolly old Jeff snuggled up in his warm duvet and his three electric blankets. All right, Jeff, what are you trying to say? I'm trying to say that I've made up the beds in the spare room if you want to go and tell them. 
Uh, what did you want to be again? Was it buried, cremated or canonised? I think I'll just settle for drunk. You were lucky to get out of Euston without a needle in your arm and somebody's hand up your jumper. I can look after myself, Mr Miller. Yes, but who's going to look after you while you're doing it? <laughs> I mean, do you want to finish up sleeping in shop doorways? Sitting in Trafalgar Square, wrestling the pigeons for breadcrumbs? And they're tough pigeons. They win two out of three. <laughs> I'm buying them. <laughs> OK, Fiona, as it happens, your numbers come up and I'm going to do you a favour. Can you help me find somewhere to stay then, Mr Miller? Better than that. And there's a bus ticket here that'll take you back across the border. Next bus leaves Victoria at two o'clock. There you go. No charge. Oh. And if you were to mention to your local paper when you get home that your MP very kindly gave you a free bus ticket, I'll leave that entirely up to you. Oh, how nice it is to do good work secretly and have them found out by accident. And another thing. But it's not as simple as that, though, Mr Miller. You see, I can't really go home. Why not? My stepdad started, like, coming into my room. Oh. Jean, you wouldn't have a couple of minutes to have a wee chat with Fiona here, would you? Oh, I'd love to, Ken, but I've got a lot on my plate as it is. Uh, awfully sorry. Urgent appointment. Mustache. Ah, uh, excuse me. <clears throat> so what should I do then, Mr Miller? Do you have any suggestions? I know it's an awful bad habit, Fiona, but, uh, would you like a cigarette? <laughs> it's a pity you can't get back in your house, Terry. Yes, isn't Especially it? Especially as it's still standing empty. <sighs> I suppose that's illegal. No, isn't it? No, squatting's not illegal yet. It's only illegal if you break in, but if you happen to find a door left open. Your key doesn't still fit the lock, does it? I'd hardly try that, Mrs Price, when we've been evicted. No, it doesn't fit. They changed the lock. Pity. Yes. Mind you, if there's a gale or something and a branch happens to shatter a pane of glass and you can get your hand in and reach the catch, well, that's not too illegal. Yeah, storm damage. So, what's the weather forecast? Well, it certainly wasn't fine with scatter breaking and entering. I'd happily pop round myself after dark to check for broken windows, but as an MP, you don't like to be too closely identified with uh, bad weather. Yeah, well, I'd go and look myself, only I'm a bit well known around there. Mind you, Jeff knows a bit about trees. What do you mean, I know a bit about trees? We'd be able to get the car into the garage and the washing out of our hair. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, Terry, if you'll give me your address, I might pop round later on and turn the soil over. Oh, I'll just need my gardening tools. <laughs> uh, Jean, about this, uh... Doss out on the embankment tonight. Solidarity with our uh, man in the flared trousers. Yeah, 10.30 in the lobby, Norman. Yes, well, the thing is, I'm afraid that uh, matters are rising, sudden engagements, you know, burdens of office, presence required, duty calls, wriggle out of it, just impossible. Sad to miss it. Have to excuse me. There you go. <laughs> I see. Well, um, I'm sorry you can't make it, Norman. Oh, so am I. Bitterly disappointed. Uh, ideal night for it, too. I mean, temperature forecast, minus six. That should have the monkeys out with the brass away. Yeah, I'll listen after the client. Just the sort of conditions you want to draw attention to the plight of the roofless, eh? Nothing like a cold snap to melt the icy hearts. I'll be with you in spirit, of course. Well, OK. There's plenty of others coming. Thanks for letting me know. Oh, least I could do. Only courteous. Uh, what is your other sudden appointment, by the way, Norman? Late night sitting? Oh, no, actually, it's the uh, MP's all-party karaoke night in the stranger's bar. <laughs> And it, not that I wanted to go, but having a bit of a voice, I was sort of pushed forward, you see. Well, we'll all be rooting for you, Norman. Me and all the homeless will be thinking of you, karaoke away. Yes, well, keep warm. Don't forget your willy, uh, ear warmers. <laughs> uh, by the way, what happened to your couple that were living in the car? Uh, they're squatting somewhere, I heard, is that right? Yeah, back in their own house. They uh, found a window open. Oh, Providence lent a hand then, eh? That or a hammer. <laughs> well, I'll see you, Jean. You'll have to excuse me. I've got to go and practice my scales. Either practice them or scrape them off. <laughs> uh, look, it's about tonight. Yeah, 10 30 in the lobby. Well, it's just I, I've got a touch of the old bronchitis. Bronchitis? Yeah, I mean, normally I would do it like a shot, but with my chest, well, I wouldn't like to risk it, you know? No, obviously, no point in making yourself ill. No, no. So we'll take a rain check on it, eh? Or should that be a snow check? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. See you tomorrow. Yeah, oh, uh, what happened to the wee lassie? Oh, she's okay. I got her into a hostel. She can stay for three nights. Three nights? 
What happens after three nights? Oh, your guess is as good as mine, isn't it, Jean? I mean, I'm just one man with a couple of quid. I'm not the Salvation Army. She'll be back on the street. She's a young girl. She's 19. It's considered an adult. Three others like her have just stepped off the southbound train. I'll have to buy some more bus tickets. Hello, Jean. Oh, no. I can see I'm going to be sleeping on my own tonight. No, no, just checking it's still on. 10.30, is it? Yes. Yes, it's still on. <coughs> Good, I'll see you there, then. <coughs> oh, excuse me. <coughs> you mean you're going to be there, Richard? Of course. I said I would be. My word isn't just my bond, Jean. My word is guilt-edged securities. <laughs> Compassion for the unfortunates in society is not the sole prerogative of the Labour Party. Well, I'll eat my thermal underwear. I wouldn't. You'll probably need them. <laughs> I've made sure I've got something nice and warm to sleep in. What's that, Richard? A nest of fibres? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll see you there, then. Cheerio. Evening, Harry. Evening, sir. Your cat not well. <laughs> I haven't got a cat. Why did you ask? Hello, Jean. Bedding down. Oh, hello, Richard. Bitter, isn't it? As lemons, yes, indeed. Finished talking to the press at last? Yes, you? yes. Told them all how sympathetic I was with the plight of the homeless, how I'd organised this little sleep out. You had organised? Uh, well, when I say I, I mean we had organised. <laughs> uh, yes, well, um, you can put your sleeping bag here if you'd like. No, no, that's fine. I've already organised a place just over here. Well, good night then, Jean. Oh, good night, Richard. I hope you managed to get some sleep in this cold. Yeah, me too. Me too. Richard. Yes? It's a bit chilly out here. Yeah, well, it's supposed to be, Freddy. There'd be no moral bonus if we were too comfortable. <laughs> it's just that you've got the camper. I've got the hamper. Oh, is that for me? Thank you very much indeed. I'm helping the homeless. Mrs. Iqbal on the phone. Who? Mrs. Iqbal. Oh, uh, what does she want? Uh, her mother-in-law's been trying to set fire to her again. She put paraffin on her slippers this time. Oh, well, um, give her an appointment for next week, if she can wait. Um, I'm afraid Mrs. Price is rather busy in the house today. Would next Saturday be all right? Ten o'clock? Fine. And if it happens again, she's to call the police. Uh, Mrs. Price says you're to call the police, Mrs. Iqbal, if she does it again. <laughs> yes. Well, or the fire brigade, obviously. Not at all. Bye. Poor woman. 
You're telling me. Why does her mother-in-law keep trying to set fire to her? Don't they get on? No, they get on like a house on fire. That's what she does. <laughs> Frightening, really. Well, it was one of those arranged marriages, and the in-laws keep wanting more diary. What? And her father hasn't got it? I don't think so, but even if he had, I don't see why you should pay someone to marry your daughter. Looking at most men, you'd pay them not to. Mm. <laughs> there must be some solution to the problem. Yeah, there's usually quite a simple solution to all women's problems, Robert. What's that? Divorce him and buy a dog. <laughs> I think I'll go and have my lunch now. What sort of remarks? Well, I wouldn't want to repeat them, really. Well, don't worry about him. He's just my secretary. Yes, we're all equal here. Well, I'm sure you can imagine this sort of thing when you get a few men together. All they seem to talk about is sex. Um, excuse me. If you don't mind my giving a man's perspective, that's not strictly true. We tend more to talk about things like the news or sport. In fact, men very rarely discuss sex with each other at all. What they do is talk about sex in front of women, but when there's not a woman there, they don't talk about it. Thank you for that edition of Panorama, Robert. <laughs> anyway, Julie, if you want to pursue a case for sexual harassment, you're going to have to stand up and repeat what they said. So if you could, keep a record and write things down. Well, then I'll be writing all day. It's constant innuendo, Mrs Price. And it's not just what they say. It's got to them throwing pencils on the floor to have an excuse to look up my skirt. <laughs> Sorry, I cut my bar out. And I mean, these aren't yobbers, Mrs Price. These are estate agents. Is there a difference? <laughs> uh, have you tried putting your complaints in a letter? Yeah, and I got one back. It was heavy breathing in longhand. Well, what about your boss? Does he know what's going on? Well, he's one of the worst offenders. Well, if anything, he encourages the other two. Well, that's what I don't understand. He's got a daughter of my age. Well, why does he do it? Well, he wouldn't like it done to her. He probably doesn't make the connection. Uh, how about your trade union? There isn't one, Mrs. Price. It's just a small estate agent's. Well, it wasn't too bad when the property market was booming, but these days they've got nothing else to do. Well, it even happens in front of the clients sometimes. Mm, it sounds as though you may well have a good case. My husband uh, at the law centre would be better able to advise you. I'll have a word. Oh, thank you. I mean, I like the job itself, Mrs. Price. I like what I do. It's just having to listen to foul-mouthed, brainless idiots all day that gets me down. I know what you mean. It's the same where I work. <laughs> She's got a good case, Jeff. Well, I don't think the handle will come off. It's just, is it worth the trouble of lugging it round the courts? What's she going to gain by it? Even say it's all true. Of course it's true. Yeah, but just say it's true and she goes to the tribunal, gets some compensation, the firm gets its knuckles wrapped. What then? Justice gets done. Things change. <laughs> this well, woman is being sexually harassed on a regular basis. It's nine to five sleaze, non-stop. What's that up? You pull over and whoops, I drop my pencil. They should not get away with it. Well, maybe not. Not, maybe not, Jeff. The point is, she's now stuck in an office with three blokes lecheting after her. But if she takes out a case for sexual harassment and wins, she's then stuck in an office with those same three blokes who now hate her guts. But what definition is that an improvement in her situation? Now, I mean, if she worked for a large company and was able to move to another department, fine. But you see, big laws just don't work for small businesses. So what would your advice to her be? Well, cut her losses and look for another job. Go in one day in a bikini, get a good reference and hop it. Well, so she should be punished for being victimised? No, I'm sorry, Jeff, that is not good enough. She has to make a stand. What's the point of having these laws if they're no use to anybody? Well, they look good in leather binding. The whole legal system is useless. I tell myself that every day. Jeff, I say you've had a wasted life, mate. <laughs> I don't feel like an MP, Norman. I'm an agony aunt specialising in women's issues. Oh, women. Yes, they can be very bothersome, these minority groups. There are two million more women than men in this country, Norman. They are hardly a minority group. Oh, I didn't mean numerical minority. I meant more in terms of importance. <laughs> but male MPs don't get half these problems. If you have a look at my post bag, I've got the sexual harassment case. Oh, yes, my wife got a lot of that at work. A battered wife? Got several constituents married to women in that sort of situation. Do you know, on average, it takes 32 incidents of domestic violence before a woman will leave a man. I mean, why? I don't know, Jean. You think they take the hint? <laughs> you try finding a place in a refuge. Then there is Mrs. Iqbal. Her mother-in-law keeps trying to set fire to her. Why, can't you get the extra heating allowance? <laughs> and yet another child custody battle. Oh, yes. I had all that in my divorce. Child custody. It can get very messy, but fortunately I won the case and she had to have them. 
<laughs> you know, all this is all so unnecessary, Norman. And do you know what causes it? Yes, the Tory party. I was going to say men, actually. Yes, full of men, the Tory party. They've got a lot to answer for. Oh, dear, more constituents, letters. Is there no end to this junk mail? <laughs> Never mind man's inhumanity to man. It's man's inhumanity to women we should be worrying about. Mothers-in-law aren't men. It's not men trying to set fire to people. That's different. That's culturally based. Oh, well, that's OK, then. We wouldn't want to offend any ethnic minorities. I simply don't understand why men are so violent. Some, not all. Violent people usually come from violent backgrounds. Anyway, where do most people usually get their first taste of violence? From their mothers. Well, that's just a smack. What, you're four years old getting your legs tanned by some nine-foot-high psycho with a hairbrush and that does no damage? <laughs> Men might not be so violent to women if women hadn't started hitting them in the first place. The reason why mothers chastise their children, Ken... Chastise. That's a nice word for belting people. It is usually because the father is evading his responsibilities by going off every night to his local refuge for eight pints of in-depth counselling. So, are you saying that men are spending their time hitting their wives when they really ought to be hitting their children? No, I am not saying anything of the sort. You can have discipline without violence. I never hit my children. No, me neither, but all seems a bit too simple, Jean. X chromosomes are all good, the Ys are all bad. It's sugar and spice on one hand and frogs and snails and a dog's backside on the other. All I am saying is that might isn't right. You take the case I've got here, this poor woman. She gets divorced, she gets custody of her child, comes down to London to try and start a new life, and what happens? What? The father and some friend of his pick up the child from outside the school gates and banish. The woman's distraught. She doesn't know where the child is, if she'll ever see him again. And? She's his mother, Ken. Yeah, but the man was the father. Maybe he was a bit distraught at never seeing him again. I think you're missing the point. Am I? Which is what? She was awarded custody. Yes, and he was awarded access. But when your ex-wife takes your ex-child 400 miles away, it makes access a trifle inconvenient, doesn't it? How do you know so much about it? You're talking about Heather Campbell, aren't you? Her husband's my constituent. Yes, of course. Oh, well, that's wonderful, Ken. Now, if you can find out where he is, then you can help get the child back where he belongs. What? To its rightful owner? No, I'm sorry, Jean. I think I've already done that. You can't legislate against human nature, Jean. Of course you can, Richard. That's half the purpose of government, isn't it? To stop people doing what they want to. Well, it may be the purpose of a Labour government. Killjoys Unlimited. I see. So you're all in favour of rape, murder and incest, are you? If that's where people's interests lie. No. But obviously we have to have some rules and regulations. Yes, so what's the point of having laws against sexual harassment if it's so difficult to get any justice? Well, burglar alarms don't bite, but they still deter people. I just think you're taking a sledgehammer to crack a nut. And it's quite obvious in this instance whose nuts it is need cracking. <laughs> well, you can't deny that sometimes women do lead men on. Look at the provocative ways some of these women get dressed. I mean, wandering around in their skimpies. If they were posters on the underground, they'd be banned as being sexist. And how many times does a woman say no when she means yes? Well, if yes means yes and no means yes, what word is there for no? <laughs> yes, it is awfully difficult, isn't it? But things can swing too far the other way, and then men's rights are undermined. I mean, a man isn't even entitled to his conjugals anymore. Why should he be entitled to his conjugals? Well, if a wife's entitled to her housekeeping, he ought to get something for his money. <laughs> How would you feel if your wife suddenly jumped on you and demanded her conjugals? I must admit, I'd be somewhat taken aback. <laughs> but I'm sure that most of this sexual harassment is nothing more than uh, a little light-hearted banter. Richard, a client walks into an estate agent's office where this woman works. Her boss says to the man, Would you like a cup of tea? I'll get melons to make it. <laughs> Is that light-hearted banter? Well, it's probably just a nickname. Why, when I was at boarding school, they used to call me Chunky Marmalade. I am talking about sexual harassment. So am I. I used to have to sleep with my cricket bat. Well, then, you ought to be more sympathetic. I am, but you can't legislate against every little knock in life, Jean. And the fact is... There is no means on earth to prevent someone from coveting their neighbour's ass. <laughs> or indeed any other portion of their anatomy. <laughs> no, I agree, Richard. You can't stop someone from coveting their neighbour's ass, but you should be able to stop them whistling at it. <laughs> and, in order to accomplish this, I am going to go out and kick some. <laughs>
don't know where he is. I don't suppose you'd tell me anyway. Look, Jean, he's a nice man. The boy loves him. He wanted to be with his father. The courts thought otherwise, Ken. Oh, well, as long as the child's wishes were taken into consideration. They were acting in the child's best interests. Yeah, and a child wouldn't know what they were, I suppose. That isn't what I said, Ken. That's what the judge said. Yeah, a woman judge. What's the judge's sex got to do with it? Well, it's always got a lot to do with it in rape trials. Why not in child custody cases? You can't set yourself up as some one-man appeal court, some kind of Scottish Robin Hood. The mother got custody, that's it. Yeah, and immediately legged it over the border so the father might never see his son again. He could have visited a weekend? Oh, of course, yeah. 60 quid fare and overnight in a hotel. He could easily afford that, especially with all the alimony he's paying. You've certainly gone down in my estimation, Ken. Oh, dear, that'll keep me awake at night. <laughs> to come between a mother and her child is unnatural. Well, it's all right to come between a father and his child, is it? That's standard practice. Who was this so-called friend who helped abduct the child from outside the school? That's what I want to know. Oh, Jean, don't be so melodramatic. You can't abduct your own child. The boy came out of school, saw his father standing there and ran up the road to meet him, like... Like what, Ken? Like some long-lost uncle? It's an amazingly clear account you give for someone who knows nothing about it. All right, Jean. Have it your own way. Every man that ever trod the face of the earth is a woman-hating child molester. There's never been a man did anything right. There's not a decent one amongst us. Well, no argument there. <laughs> Excuse me. Is it a man? Is it a rocket? Is it Mickey Mouse? No, it is an amazing new man with special ingredients doing the washing up. You may have seen him in the telephone kiosk changing into his apron. You know what I like about you doing the washing up, Jeff? It's the way you bring it that unique sense of occasion. Oh, and by the way, how sexual harassment? Well, it hasn't been so bad since I stopped wearing those tight trousers. <laughs> Jeff. Look, she needs some corroboration. At the moment, it's only her word against theirs, and they're going to say, but it wasn't sexual harassment, Your Honour. Just a bit of harmless verbal ping-pong. But they are chucking pencils on the floor to look up her skirt. But you see, you can't take a man to court for throwing a pencil on the floor. But worry not, Jean, I have the master plan. Here, it's my dictation machine. Tell her to put it in her desk and take a recording of what they say. Thanks, Sherlock. Elementary, my dear Clotson. <laughs> Tell me, how are the child custody wars going? I'm sure Ken knows where they are. Well, perhaps you could beat it out of him. What are you looking for? Oh, I'm just sorting through these old keys. I thought I'd clear them out. Yeah. And talking of abductions, do you see the paper? Three-month-old baby taken from her pram. Oh, no. You feel sorry for them, though, don't you? Women like that who take someone else's baby. It's help they need, not prison. Yes. Mind you, it could have been a man who took it. They should lock people like that up and throw away the key. <laughs> but his constituent, Norman, has abducted my constituent's son. Well, maybe, Jean, but his constituent also happens to be the child's father. That's got nothing to do with it. He's a complete red herring. Wouldn't matter if he was a kipper and the mother was the little mermaid. <laughs> Blood is thicker than the judge's decisions. That must have some small ball bearing on the case, surely. You can't go abducting him back. It's a ward of court case now. Well, I do think you could be more helpful. I am not on playground patrol duty, sorting out these little squabbles. I can't make Ken Miller tell you his constituents' whereabouts, can I? I thought you said that ten minutes in the whip's office you could get anyone to tell you anything. Well, normally, yes, but the bulb's gone in my bright light and we've had letters from Amnesty. <laughs> no, you take my tip, Jean. Leave it to the lawyers. Let them tie a yellow ribbon round the old dirty briefs. Well, it's dreadful the way children get used as weapons in these divorce battles. Men who wouldn't even give their children a wash suddenly can't live without them. They just use them to get back at their wives. Yes, it's very sad. My heart goes out to them, but what can you do? Tragedy of our times. It's an appalling situation. Didn't happen to notice what was on the menu for lunch, did you? <laughs> Never mind about lunch, Norman. I thought we were supposed to be the party of the family, too. You know, I've been wondering just lately if we shouldn't be concentrating more on the orphans' vote. <laughs> ah, Jean, there you are, excuse me. Uh, I, I wondered whether you had a minute. What's up, Richard? You look like a hunted man. You look as though the dogs are after you. Yes, well, it's either that or the cows. <laughs> Care for a bracer, Jean? Ah, uh, no, my braces are fine, thanks. Uh, but don't let me stop you from having something to keep your trousers up. <laughs> Have um, flowers been made tax-deductible? No. 
It's this woman, Jean, this constituent. Uh, as you know, I, I do have my circle of admirers out in the shires. Well, it must be the chunks in your marmalade that does it, Richard. <laughs> what it is to be thick cut. Yes, probably something like that. And of course, having pop star status is all part of the job for some of us. But this woman has just taken things far too far. In what way? Well, flowers, as you can see. Before, during, and aftershave. <laughs> Chocolates. Uh, would you care for a box? Oh, thank you. And it's not just all this, Jean. She sends me underwear. Oh, well, I'm sure an extra set of marmalade jars always comes in handy. <laughs> no, she sends me her underwear. And not just her underwear. She also sends me photographs of her wearing it. And more recently. Yes. Photographs of her not wearing it. <laughs> and then there are, well, there's telephone calls, of course. <laughs> That's probably her now. In fact, the whole thing is getting extremely worrying, Jean. I received this this morning, this invitation. She now thinks we're getting married. But what about your wife? Well, naturally, she thinks we're married already. <laughs> I mean, I, I admit I'm fairly well polished, but I don't want everyone taking a shine to me. How long has this been going on? A couple of weeks. It all started with my cucumbers. Your cucumbers? Yes. My real cucumber campaign, if you remember, for British cucumbers with real taste and twisty bits. And none of your standardised foreign rubbish. Yeah, I remember. EEC bureaucrats in cucumber lumber. Yes. Well, obviously, it thrusts me into a certain prominence. And she's been battering me ever since. <laughs> I've been living the life of a fugitive. It's Ronnie Biggs all over again. In fact, I, I thought of making a public statement to say that I've embraced feminism. Do you think that might work? Well, uh, can't you call the police? Well, I could, but it's... Not the sort of thing you want to get about, is it? I mean, a man who can't keep his women under control? Well, he cuts a pitiful figure. Like a jockey who's fallen off his horse. <laughs> well, I'd like to help Richard, but I don't quite see what I can do. I just thought that as you're a woman, Jean, you would have a better insight into the illogical and devious ways a woman's mind might work. <laughs> Why would someone become infatuated with me? Yeah, good question, Richard. <laughs> Well, be honest. You must have done something to lead her on. Uh, have you got my rubber there, please? No, I'm using my own. Is that my correction fluid? No, it's mine. Jean, this is childish. I didn't start it. Neither did I. Look, I'm sorry about this child custody business, but I cannot give you the man's address. My first loyalty is to my constituent, after all. Yeah, and my first loyalty is to my constituent, Ken. Yes, I know, but just because they're at loggerheads, it doesn't mean we have to be. I mean, I've got a great deal of respect for you, Jean. When you first started here, I thought you were a bit of a dooley, but you've come on really well. Yeah, well, I love you too. Good. Right, I'm off over to the house then. Golden slumbers. See you later. Oh. Hello, Jean. <laughs> Sorry, did I startle you? No. <laughs> ah, young man. Oh, Mr. Monk. Uh, tell me, is um, Mrs. Price available to pair tonight? Oh, she had to go up to Scott. Up north for the day. I don't think she'll be back, so yes, I should think you could miss the vote. Good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yep, yeah. anything I can find out. Okay, I'll be in touch. Yeah. Bye. <sighs> Right. Oh, perfect. You? Good trip. Trip? Where was that? Hadrian's Wall, the nice side. <laughs> Sorry? I just had my constituent on the phone telling me his son was picked up yesterday afternoon outside his school by his mother. They were then taken off in a car by, driven by another woman. Yes? Wonder who that was. I mean, what do you think you're doing, Jean? Kidnapping? Abduction? Oh, don't be so melodramatic, Ken. How can a mother abduct her own son? I mean, what are you doing? Playing God Almighty? 
Well, I knew God was a woman. I didn't quite realise I was sharing an office with her. Oh, I'm playing. That's good coming from you. I've just had the guy on the phone. It was like holding a shower to your ear. You'll get over it. Oh, yes, of course he will. I, I, I told him that. I said to him, what are you, some kind of wimp crying over a bairn? You'll be eating quiche next. That's so <laughs> Well, what about me, though, Jean? I was the one he'd confided in. I was the only one who knew where that child was. How do you think that makes me look? When I go back to my constituency, I'll have to carry a handbell. You didn't tell me where he was. I just managed to find out for myself. No, I didn't tell you, did I, Jean? Well, let me give you a, a wee bit of advice. Next time you open somebody's drawer, Remember to lock it after you. Yeah, I was only thinking of the child. <laughs> Ken? Ken! So I did as your husband said and left the tape recorder in the desk. Then when they'd heard what they'd actually been saying played back, well, there couldn't be much doubt about it. No, I bet. Their faces were about as red as the air was blue. I think they surprised themselves. So the tribunal agreed that the harassment had taken place and awarded me the compensation. Oh, good. I'm glad it was successful. So, um, how are things in the office now? I don't know, Mrs Price. I was sacked when I got back. <laughs> oh. Well, uh, at least the harassment stopped. Yeah. <laughs> but the bills haven't, though. I wonder if I shouldn't have just put up with it. Well, at least I'd still have a job and a salary. No, it was a brave thing you did, Julie. You made a stand. It makes it easier for the next person, doesn't it? Yeah, well, I hope so. It certainly hasn't made anything easier for me. Well, people who want their rights have to be troublemakers or they don't get them. Yeah, but you can live without your rights, but you can't live without a job. Well, I'm sure you did the right thing, Julie. I'll uh, speak to my husband and he'll make sure all the compensation comes through. <laughs> Thanks for everything and I'll be in touch. Bye. Bye. Uh, is that it, Robert? Are we clear? Um, just a couple of messages. Nothing that can't wait. Oh, anything from Mrs Iqbal? She never kept that appointment. No. Well, I suppose it all fizzled out. <laughs> you have her number, would you? I might just give her a phone call. So oh, they're roasting the old chestnuts again then, eh? Stand still long enough, everything comes round again. What, history repeat itself? I think it's got hiccups. Well, I'll leave it with you then. Cheerio. Norman, I think you've gone into cryptic mode again. Well, didn't I make myself clear then? I get the distinct impression with you sometimes that someone shook the bottle. It's a debate, Jim. <laughs> Private members' motion. MP salaries raising their ugly black heads again. MP salaries? But we're doing very nicely, thank you, aren't we? I mean, now we're all linked to the civil service grades, we get discreet little automatic increases the public needn't know about. And some of the whips must get paid even more than I do. Do they? Oh, maybe so. I mean, I barely glance at the payslips of myself. And we don't exactly come in here and get our hands dirty. Obviously, I can't see any justification in extra increases. I mean, I'm happy with my little portion. I don't regard politics as a soft option. Oh, good heavens, why, I, I liked it down the mines. I'd be down there again tomorrow if I could find one open. <laughs> Rather than being stuck in some comfy office, but someone has to do it. Very self-sacrificing of you, Norman, and you can always wear your lamp when you feel nostalgic. I am here to help society, Jean, and if society wants to help me in return, who am I to stop them expressing their gratitude? You can't be held to ransom by your employers, Jean. 
Our constituents are our employers. Ah, yes, and a right bunch of petty tyrants they are, too. Wouldn't even let you have a tea break, tight fisted so and so. <laughs> no, we must fight the boss class, Jean. And we must not forget our socialist roots. Well, I'm not voting for any increase. How can we ask other people to tighten their belts when we're bursting out of our braces? Well, I'm not suggesting that, Jean. Tory backbenchers' idea, all this. I don't think we should even dignify these proposals by bothering to discuss them. Let's all just abstain, eh? Abstain? Not vote against? Haughty disdain, Jean. Lofty heights, dignified profiles. Huh? Not even attend the debate. Not even stoop to their level. Oh, I see. We abstain. The salary increase goes through. And when my constituents say, what are you doing giving yourself a handout? I say, it wasn't us, Gav. They stuffed it in our pockets. <laughs> if the money is forced on us, Jean, what can we do? I mean, I know it's a scandal the way these Tories go Norman, on. Norman, but... I am not voting for any more money, not even by default. We get quite enough here as it is. Don't we, Harry? Yes, Mrs. Price. More than ample. <laughs> you know, I had to fight an election to get this job. You wouldn't credit it, would you? No, not really. <laughs> we get about 30,000 basic, another 27,000 secretarial allowance, mileage, travel, office, telephone. The whole package works out at over 60,000. Yes, you're absolutely right, Jean. It is so difficult to make ends meet. I mean, £30,000 goes absolutely nowhere. It probably cost me that to stay on the road. My, what are you driving now, Richard? A Sherman tank? <laughs> I mean, MP's salary is part-time wages for a part-time job. But even so, £30,000 is not much, is it? I mean, the tea ladies are probably on there. Probably wish they were. <laughs> I thought being an MP was a full-time occupation. Well, I think MPs should undertake other activities myself. I mean, I feel that my banking and stock exchange interests uh, keep me in touch with the ordinary man in the street. The only contact you have with the ordinary man in the street is when you park on his foot. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I took a tube train the other day, so don't tell me I'm out of touch. Just to be an MP, oh, I wouldn't feel I was taxed. No, I expect you've got accountants working day and night to see that never happens. <laughs> and far from being overpaid, British MPs are among the lowest paid politicians in the world. We ought to get more. Top whack for top people is what I say. After all, Gene, you pay peanuts, you get monkeys. You pay small bags of peanuts, you get small bags of monkeys. <laughs> if you want gorillas, you gotta pay coconuts. At some parties, you seem to get monkeys, no matter what you pay them. <laughs> You're so keen on our salary going up. How about supporting my proposals for an increase in income support and social security benefits? No, I don't think I can do that, Gene. I'm not really in favor of handouts. Handouts? Oh, that's what they are. People can have things too easy, Jean. I know these extra heating allowances for pensioners and so on. They'll be wanting free ice lollies in the summer next. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> anyway, it doesn't require that much initiative to nip oneself a woolly hat and stick it on one's head. Especially when one is bedridden with arthritis in one's fingers. No, no. Too much of a safety net just breeds a dependency culture. And everyone knows that half these people on the dole are on the fiddle. Well, maybe if Social Security were enough, they wouldn't need to fiddle. Do you think you could manage on income support? Oh, yes. I think I could quite easily make myself some good nourishing hot broth with a few old vegetables to last me a couple of weeks. Yes, more money is not the answer, Jean. It's thrift. There are already vast numbers of benefits available. How about the benefit of the doubt? Housing <laughs> benefits, vouchers for glasses, free nashers. I mean, some of these people out there, they're living the life of Riley, chewing merrily away at the taxpayer's expense. Well, it seems such an attractive package, I'm inclined to apply for it myself. Oh, oh, good. Well, if it's as easy as you say, how would you like to live on income support for a fortnight to show us how it's done? Do you really think you can manage that? Me? Who's been to public school? <laughs> fortnight income support? Yeah. Yes, all right, Jean, OK. I'll, uh, I'll live on income support if, um... If you'll take a 50-quid check from me and try a taste of what it's like to be a wealth creator, you turn that into 60 pounds by your own initiative and enterprise within the same time. Absolutely no problem. I am quite capable of earning my own living. I've done so for many years. Oh, give us a job is one thing. And create your own is quite another. Uh, you'll take a check? All right. I can trust you not to cheat. Yes, of course. You have my word as a gentleman. Can I trust you? You have my word, Richard, as an MP. Yeah. <laughs> Tell you what, maybe we should present accounts. In two weeks, then? Two weeks. See you at the weigh-in. Not that I normally bother with lightweights, of course. <laughs> <laughs> ah, gee. Double our money yet, have we? 
It's early days yet, Richard, all in due course. Well, the odds are seven to four against you doing it. The odds are ten to one that you'll be shoplifting by Thursday. Nonsense! <laughs> nourishing hot broth, Jean, nourishing hot broth. Yum, yum. No, I'm coping splendidly on income support. It seems more than ample to me. Good. I'll see you then. Excuse me. Uh, Jean? Check? Sorry? The check for my income support that I'm supposed to be living on. I thought I gave it to you yesterday when you gave me my £50 state money. Yes, well, obviously I had yesterday's check, yes. <laughs> I, uh, I just wonder about today's. That was supposed to last you a week, Richard. I beg your pardon? A week. It's a week's money, not a day's. Yes, of course. Oh, well, I'll see you on Judgment Day for the last trumpet. Good God. What's up, Richard? Looks like you've lost a pound and found an EQ. Ah, oh, Freddie, uh, just after a bite, are you? Well, I'd love to come and have lunch with you. How very, very kind of you. Thank you so much. Ah, Jean. The woman of the moment. Now, this little thing you've got on here. Wages with Squire Monkton and the like. Oh, you've heard about that, have you? Oh, nothing escapes the eagle ear. You know what it is in the whip's office? Yeah, two parts suspicion, eight parts paranoia. The thing is, can you make the shareholders happy, get the return on investments? Well, I've hardly had time to think about it, Norman, but I'm sure anyone with a modicum of ability can turn £50 into 60 in a fortnight without too much trouble. Oh, I'm sure they can, Jean. I'm sure they can. Anyone with a modicum of ability could manage that. How about yourself? <laughs> I flatter myself I have a modicum of ability, Norman. Two modicums, even. Why? Oh, nothing, nothing. It's just that we wouldn't like to see you not succeeding, that's all. Would reflect badly on, like, labour economic policy, your money in our hands. So any help you need with a little wealth creation from our high-flying economic team? I'm sure I can manage, thank you. Or any more concrete assistance, uh, like that? Like what? Like that. Good heavens, Jean, is that yours? You seem to have dropped a tenner. Norman, I did it my way, all right? Well, you do it any way you like, just so long as you do it. Ah, excuse me. Get off. Certainly. <laughs> Scrounging back benches, they'd have the hairs of your legs if they weren't glued on. <laughs> Most new businesses don't have a show of profit for four years. I've got a show one in my first fortnight. Turning £50 into 60 that's a 20% profit. What about a building society? No, no good. Won't make enough. I thought of that. Two weeks' interest on 50 quid works out at about ninepence. <laughs> a few bit short of the mark, eh? Anyway, it's not productive. You're just taking advantage of other people's need for a nest in order to feather your own. Well, what do you do with your savings, Angie? Stick them under the bed, let inflation ravage them nightly. I mean, you're not creating wealth or work. You're just charging other people to borrow your money. Yeah, you should see what my bank manager charges me to borrow his money. Pawnbrokers only hang up balls, bank managers hang you up by them. <laughs> Can you? But I'm running two homes, Jean. One up there, one down here. It's not cheap. I'm living beyond my meanness. You get allowances. Yeah, I'm living beyond my allowances, too. I thought the Scots were thrifty. Oh, yeah. Going to a pub in Scotland on a Friday night? Gallons of thrift everywhere. You're not voting for this additional increase, are you? Oh, no. I won't bother with that. You mean you'll be abstaining? Oh, no. Abstaining, never. I probably won't even attend the debate, Jean. I've got more to worry about than MP's salary. I see the inertia vote. It wasn't me, Your Honour. I didn't rob the electorate. The Tories grabbed my wallet, sir, and stuck the money inside. Mm. Well, Jean, only 12 days, four hours, three minutes to go. Oh, yes. What am I going to do? Well, it seems to me if you want to make a profit in this world, you can only do so in the time-honoured tradition. You find some poor, desperate soul and exploit them ruthlessly. Yes, I am not going to exploit anybody to make money. Oh. Anyway, who is there? <laughs> well, exploitation's a bit like charity, Jean. Begins at home. <laughs> a ladder? I'm not going up a ladder. You're looking at a man here who gets nosebleed on brothel creepers. I'm sure it would work, Jeff. I can easily buy a two-storey ladder, and you wouldn't need to do that many windows. If you asked three pounds a house, then you'd only have to do 20 houses and we'd have 60 pounds in no time. Uh, but what would I get out of it, apart from blisters? Well, you can keep the ladder. <laughs> what, to add to my collection? Yeah, I get my name engraved on it. Jess Ladder, and wear it when we go out. Also have the satisfaction of helping me prove to a smarmy nerd like Richard that it is possible to make a profit without actually exploiting anyone. But you're asking me to work for nothing. You'd be exploiting me. Oh, don't be ridiculous. How can you exploit your husband? As long as I'm asking you to go out in the streets. Well, if that's the way your mind's working, I'll need a new anorak. <laughs> and what about our regular window cleaner, our mate Sid? 
And a Merry Christmas to you, Mr. Price. He'll appreciate me undercutting him. He'll come round and break my rungs. <laughs> You really can't help me out in this small way, just once, if you really don't want to do window cleaning. No, I do not. Well, then, how about if you went out at the weekend and washed some cars? What is this, Bob a job week? Why don't you go out and wash some cars? <laughs> I'm far too busy to do it myself. I've got my surgery this weekend. Well, I've got a surgery, too. Dr Murray is going to set my broken golf swing. <laughs> sure you know what you're doing? Well, yes, I'm trying to save us 50 quid by not calling out the repairman. Is it serious? Well, we need to get him round to fix it. We may need to get him round to shoot it. <laughs> the car's been making funny noises, too. What sort of noises? 20 pounds an hour for labour noises. So all we say he's working for nothing down at the law centre, but I give him the chance to earn some real money doing a bit of window cleaning. Of course, he doesn't want to know. Completely unreasonable. Then why should he while I'm earning? That's the trouble with Jeff, you see. Married to me, he's got it too easy. Well, I try never to take sides between man and wife, Jean. Unless it's my wife, and then, of course, I'm on her side. I was dropping hints about not having enough money, but I give him the opportunity to earn something extra. Cleaning windows? Well, it might lead to other things. Yeah, cleaning more windows. There's the trouble with people these days, you see, they just don't want to work. I blame the unions myself, them and the socialists. It's got nothing to do with politics. No one's a more ardent socialist than me, but people just don't understand the problems of the small businesswoman. No, they go dribbling and drooling on, give us a handout, wanting their housekeeping at the end of the week. You ask them to do something for themselves, they just sit there and whine. You know, Jean, you remind me of somebody we used to see a lot round here. What was her name again? Oh, yes, Maggie something. I don't know who you're talking about. Well, <laughs> then, understand, you see, Freddy. I think just because the chap's on benefits. He's automatically some kind of scrounger who doesn't want to work. Well, they, they don't want to work, Richard. But that's not the case at all. People don't know what it's like to be caught in a poverty trap. No, I suppose not. Though I caught my foot in a rabbit hole once. <laughs> and you don't know what it's like to be at the bottom of the pile, getting cheap cuts from the supermarket. Oh, I didn't know you'd ever been in a supermarket, Richard. Ghastly places. You have to push your own trolley, you know. Good God. <laughs> A bit steep when you're spending money. Make some nourishing hot broth, they say. Well, man cannot live on nourishing hot broth alone. No, no, needs his meat and veggies too. In fact, to be honest. Yeah? Trying to live on this amount of money. Well, quite frankly, Freddy, my wife's having to go hungry. Really? I'm starting to feel a bit peckish myself. I mean, people shouldn't have to rely on handouts. A decent living should be theirs by right. In fact, I'd say there was even a case for upgrading benefits of anything. Upgrading them? Oh, I don't know about that. I mean, where would the extra money come from? Who'd pay for it? Soak the rich, Freddy. They can afford it. They're all fiddling their taxes anyway. They're the real scroungers. In fact, I have a damn good mind to write to my MP about it. So who is your MP, Richard? Well, I am, I suppose. Better write to yourself, then. <laughs> that car really is on its last wheels, you know. I'm covered in it. Uh, where's the small figure? There, next to the peanut butter. Is there any particular reason why there is no hot water? Hmm? Oh, yes, I forgot. The boiler topped itself at three this afternoon. Oh, wonderful. Did you get a plumber in? Yes, I got him to come around and look at it. What did he say? Well, I'm no expert, but it sounded a bit like goody goody. <laughs> oh, hello, Jean. Any nearer hitting the financial targets, are we? How are things in the bow and arrow trade? Just drawing back the string, Norman. Oh, well, don't leave developments too late, eh? And, uh, any little help we can give, of course? Do put the rabbit back in your hat, Norman. Well, the think tank is always available, don't forget. <laughs> Go away. I'm going. I'm going. <laughs> Hello? Is that Visa? Hello. Yes, I was wondering whether I could arrange to extend uh, the limit on my credit card. Yes, I am in work, yes. Yes, I'm an MP. Hello? <laughs> Hello? Well, that was a total waste of time. A hundred surefire ways to make money. The only one that looks as though it might work is to write a book called A Hundred Surefire Ways to Make Money. What a good idea. I'm surprised no one's ever thought of it. So how's the £50 kitty now? Well and truly wormed. I spent... 
£2.60 on that book. Uh, two quid on telephone calls, 80 pence on entertaining. Yes, I'd heard you'd launched your luncheon offensive in the city. Nine pounds wasted on that edible snail breeding scheme. Yes, I must clean out my drawer. My bucket of chamois was 14.40, so I'm now left with 21 pounds 20 to turn in 60 pounds and two days left to do it. Well, Jean, it seems to me there's only a few basic ways of making money and everything else is just a permutation of them. You buy and sell, you sow and reap, smash and grab, or you speculate to accumulate. I am hardly in any position to speculate. I don't know many brokers are interested in clients with £21.20 to play with. Well, there are other high-risk, high-reward speculative ventures, Jean. Such as what? Unit trusts? Hmm, sort of. Four-legged unit trusts. Well, speaking as an experienced investment analyst, my advice for this afternoon's handicap at Kempton Park is... A new boiler? How much would that be? Oh, would you want it in pounds and pence or arms and legs? Oh, my <laughs> What about the car? Well, he said, if we're getting a new engine, we ought to get a new gearbox. And if we're having a new gearbox, we ought really to get a new garage. <laughs> then, of course, there's a washing machine. What's happening about that? Well, the memorial service is on Friday. <laughs> Where's all this money coming from? I am not a bottomless pit. Well, of course you're not. Your pit's got a very nice bottom. You don't happen to know what won the 315 at Kempton, I suppose? Yes, I think it was some kind of horse. <laughs> A dead cert, eh? Well, you were almost right. It certainly looked dead. I gave a good show. It's the first horse I have ever known go round a racetrack attended by mourners. <laughs> the one of the jockey wore black. No, I have never seen a horse before with brass handles on its side. I said to back it each way. I didn't say to put it on the nose. It wouldn't have mattered if I had punched it on the nose. As a matter of interest, how many a day does it smoke? It wasn't used to a left-hand bend. It did not need to stop and indicate. Well, I did all right anyway. I won 25 quid on an accumulator. Oh, good. I am pleased about that. Mm. Beats cleaning windows. <laughs> no use scowling at me, Jean. You should have read the small print. The value of your shares may go down as well as up. Well, I am now left with £10 to salvage my economic policy and half an hour to do it in. So do you have any further useful suggestions or shall I step out onto the window ledge and practice my noose knots? Well, there might be one <laughs> other way of making money that we've overlooked. Uh, the way of making money by not actually making money. Look, if this has anything to do with Confucius... No, 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 no. I, I'm talking about, you know, company accounts, limited liability. Capitalism looks after its own. I mean, if you haven't got the goose that lays the golden egg, you need the goose that lays the golden loopholes. I'm afraid I don't quite understand this here, Jean. This £15 loan is down as an asset. But if it's a loan, surely it's a liability. No, no, you're not reading that correctly. Actually, mm -hmm. what I've done there, you see, is to capitalise my borrowings. Oh, I see, yes. <laughs> uh, and, and what's this uh, £25 failed livestock investment? It was an unsuccessful equine enterprise. Well, I understand that uh, you can write livestock off against tax, but I, I don't quite see how you can claim mileage. I've got it down as the company horse. <laughs> and would the revenue allow that? As long as it's under 1,500 cc. Um, can you explain something to me? Yes, of course, anything like. Uh, your income was 40 pounds a week. Mm -hmm. Now, according to these figures, you seem to have spent about 500. No, 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 that can't be right. No, you must be misreading something. No, you must have done to eat in these sort of places. I mean, what does this mean? Lunch, Friday, the Ritz, DWF. Ah, uh, that's dined with friends. <laughs> NBA, WBH. Oh, that sounds for uh, nobody about and went bloody hungry. <laughs> dined with friends? Well, I think that's legitimate, don't you? I mean, the uh, unemployed do dine with their friends occasionally, don't they? If they've still got any left. <laughs> it quite sticks to the spirit of the agreement. Yeah, well, I don't know whether you have either, because according to these figures, a galvanised bucket you bought last week is now worth twice what you paid for it. Uh, the market went up. I had a tip. Now, I still don't see how you managed to pay for all this out of £40 a week. Look, an electric razor, that must have been £30 on its own. Oh, well, I had to buy one. I was starting to look stubbly. Yeah, but, but what does this mean? Razor, P-B-A. Uh, that's, um, pay by access. That's cheating. No, it isn't. It's special needs. Special needs? Yes, I specially needed a new razor. So I awarded myself a crisis loan. Crisis loans are supposed to be for things like electric cookers. Well, I can't shave with a cooker. I burn a chin. Well, what about this? Half a bottle of scotch, PBA. What justifies that? Well, I bought it with my cold weather payment to warm me up. Richard, you only get cold weather payments if there is a child under five in the family. Well, it's not my fault if the chap in the off-licence didn't explain the rules to me properly. 
Well, then, I've held up my side of the bargain. Let's see you hold up yours. Now, then, that's um, my original steak plus ten pounds. That's sixty pounds, I think. Right. Well, uh, I think you find it's all there. <laughs> well, what's all this? This is just a set of figures. A book, a bucket, and a chamois leather. That isn't 60 pounds. It is. It's just tied up in capital assets. You can see <laughs> from the balance sheet that it's all there. You just need to wait until the market picks up and you can sell it as a going concern. But a bucket isn't a going concern. This is just a meaningless set of figures. Well, it would be. It's the company accounts. <laughs> but where's my money? I don't think you've kept to the spirit of the... Ah, division bell. That's the industry bill. MP's pay is next on the agenda. Yeah. Why? Were you going to vote? Were you? As were pair? Well, I was going to vote against. I mean, I don't need the extra money. Though we have had some heavy expenses lately. Yes, me too. Uh, well, perhaps we should just go along and listen, then. Hear what the others have to say. Uh, do you think? We could hear the arguments, I suppose. Yes. Well, as you say, we don't want our constituents to think we're awarding ourselves hefty and undeserved increases, but if other people feel we should have them, well, walk a mile in my shoes, I say. Hand-stitched, are they, Richard? Oh, it's the only way to travel. <laughs> And if some people think that uh, it's easy living on an MP's salary, well, they just don't realise the problems involved. I mean, if they think it's that simple living on an MP's wages, Jim. Yes. Yeah. I'd like to see them do it. More than anything, Mrs. Price. I can well imagine. Because I only went in for an ulcer. I wasn't expecting them to whip my spleen out as well. <laughs> no, but I presume there must have been something wrong with it. Not as far as I was concerned, I'd never had any bother with it. It was still under warranty like. I mean, they said nothing about spleens when I had the estimate. The medical. <laughs> yes, Mr. Webb. But they wouldn't have taken it out for no reason. No, they took it out because it was ruptured. Oh, well, if they took it out because it was ruptured, then that probably saved your life. Well, no, not really. Why not? Because it was them who ruptured it. <laughs> See, it was ruptured during the operation. Yes. Don't know what he was doing, poking about in there, but... Uh, and when did you realise? Not till the nurse mentioned it. She came in with his penicillin, and when I asked why I had to take it, she said, because of the risk of pneumonia. And when I said, why is there a risk of pneumonia, she said, because it would taken my spleen out. It's related. So they say, yeah. Yeah. Um, what was the nurse's reaction? She wasn't bothered. It was no skin off her nose. It's all in a day's work to them, Mrs. Price. And has the operation affected you specifically in any other way? Well, I haven't been able to ride my moped much. <laughs> it's been a bit of a pang with the stitches. Yes, but it hasn't done you any real lasting harm. Well, I'll be on antibiotics forever. But I don't know that that's the point, is it? I mean, what was he doing in there rummaging about? It's a bit negligent, isn't it? You go in for one thing and they take out another. But what if I'd gone in for a vasectomy? I might have had to change my name. I can understand your concern. And it's not just the physical side, you see, Mrs. Price. You don't feel a full shilling. I get a bit depressed by it. It might sound a bit stupid, but it's a bit like getting burgled. Yeah, I can appreciate that, Mr. Webb. I had my handbag stolen once, and I was quite upset for days. <laughs> what these surgeons like it if you did it to them? Like if he brought his car in to have the clutch fixed and I took the engine out. And I haven't had a proper explanation or an apology or nothing. But didn't the surgeon who performed the operation come and see you after? No, he did not. Straight after he'd finished with me, he went off on a skiing holiday. I mean, call himself a consultant. 
Well, he never consulted me. Yeah, but he must have said something to you about the risks before he started, surely, or you'd never have signed the consent form. Consent form? What consent form? <laughs> Spleen grumbled as much as he does. I'm not surprised they took it out just to get some peace. He <laughs> must have signed a consent form. They won't even shine a light up your nose unless you sign one. You've got to be unconscious when they bring you in. Unconsciousness denotes consent, does it? I believe so, for a lot of married couples. <laughs> but if they operated on him without his consent, then that's it. He's got him by the short and curlies. Yeah, rather unfortunate that they got him by his short and curlies first. <laughs> Just needs a bit of headed notepaper, and I'm sure they'll settle out of court. How much do you think you'll get? I don't know. Difficult thing to put a price on a spleen. What is it up the butcher? 60p a pound? <laughs> should be automatic redress without having to establish who's at fault. I still don't really see how they could have operated on him without a consent form. Oh, no, I didn't say there wasn't a consent form. There was? Well, no, there wasn't, but there is now. What do you mean? They doctored it? I've got this industrial injury too, you see, Norman. Oh, have you, Jean? I didn't realise that. <laughs> what, you have to wear an appliance then, do you? One of my constituents had an horrendous accident on a building site. A dumper truck overturned on him and he lost a limb. Oh, there's a pity. Mm, you see, the problem is his employers were a firm of uninsured cowboy builders who have since ridden off into the sunset. Oh, yes. Dances with scaffolding, eh? <laughs> Uh, no redress of grievance there, then? No, and he's now been refused the higher disablement allowance. I thought you just said he lost a limb. Yeah, right leg, just below the knee. Well, he should qualify for the higher allowance automatically, then, shouldn't he? No, that's what I thought, but it doesn't work that way. You see, had his leg been amputated just above the knee, then yes, he would have got the higher allowance. But as it was amputated just below the knee... He gets the lower allowance. Exactly. <laughs> because he's still got his knee. Yes, of course. You may still get the higher allowance, but it has to go to arbitration. His knee goes to arbitration. I see. You mean you're not considered to be disabled if you've still got your knee, irrespective of whether or not there's a foot attached to it? No. The case has to be assessed. Oh, you're waiting for that then, are you? Oh, no. We've already had the examination. That was when he was told he wasn't entitled to the higher allowance. Well, I thought you said he'd only got one leg. Yes, I did, if you'd listen. Well, I am listening. I just don't see why a man who has to hop everywhere isn't considered disabled. <laughs> I mean, how many legs are you supposed to lose? Six? <laughs> I don't want to be personal, Jean, but do you have a drink problem? The reason he failed the test, Norman, was they had to see how far he could walk. He managed to hop about 12 yards and then he fell over. Oh, so that proves he's fit then, does it? He tried too hard. If he'd only managed nine yards and fallen over, he'd have been all right and we'd have got the higher allowance. But as he managed 12 yards, he only gets the lower one. Well, couldn't you have warned him about that in advance so that he could have fallen over earlier? I had no idea the regulations were so ridiculous. Oh, yes, well, that's how it is in these cases, Jean. Industrial injuries, medical negligence, they can drag on for years. Seems to me people have false expectations of compensation. They think that compensation will make up for what they've lost. Exactly, that's the point of it. Well, it isn't, and it doesn't. Money is to injury what prison is to crime, Jean. It's an inadequate and unsatisfactory remedy. Yes, it is. Thanks but... for the paper. Hey, I was going to do that. I shouldn't have thought you'd have the time, love. <laughs> Are you reading it, or did you write it? What do you feature in it? Well, it just makes me sick the way they draw up these regulations. Going to draw the line somewhere? Maybe. I don't happen to think an inch above the knee is the right place to draw it. I mean, pogoing around a doctor's surgery till you fall over. <laughs> Nine yards or whatever, it's ridiculous. So how many yards would you make it? Ten? Twenty? A half marathon? What's disability? What's poverty, Ken? What's anything? Well, exactly. Someone's got to define it, or we're all entitled to it, aren't we? There'll always be someone on the margin with a sense of grievance. Look, just because there has to be unfairness in order to operate the system doesn't make it fair. Social security seems like any other form of insurance to me. They're happy to take your money, but they don't want to pay out on a claim. There should be clear-cut, no-fault compensation, and that's it. Yeah, but no fault, no responsibility. If no one's going to be blamed, doctors won't even bother burying their mistakes. They'll just give them another appointment. Meanwhile, while we worry about who to blame, I've got Mr. Webb who goes into hospital for one operation and they give him two. And when he politely asks why, they treat him as though he's a troublemaker. Well, it's just a spleen. He can still spit, can't he? <laughs> oh, I'm glad you can look on the bright side. I just hope that when something of yours gets chopped off, you're as happy about it when we set up the ping pong table. <laughs> hmm. Well, it rather seems to me, Jean, as if you're letting your heart rule your head. 
as so many socialists do. Well, we all know that your heart rate only goes up and down with a share in this. <laughs> but your reaction to every contingency is to peck at it with yet another bill. I mean, you're the parliamentary equivalent of a flock of geese. The number of times you appear in the chamber, Richard, you're the parliamentary equivalent of Christmas. <laughs> it just seems to me that it's a knee-jerk reaction. All because someone in your constituency happens to lose the odd leg or finds the odd organ missing when he wakes up. <laughs> well, it's not the end of the world. Far from being odd, he assures me that his works were perfectly normal until someone stuck a spanner in them. Well, worse things happened at sea. Oh, yes, that plaintive cry, spleen overboard. <laughs> but as a result of this legislation by Lemming, we all have to suffer. I don't see you doing any suffering. Oh, I suffer inside. I mean, the last thing we need is more safety inspectors sniffing around our toe caps. I mean, I'm involved with the consortium building nursing homes for the elderly. And do you know, they made us put banisters on the stairs. Well, how can you build low-cost housing on that place? The number of safety inspectors has been drastically reduced, Richard, as you well know. And anyway, lots of builders don't pay a blind bit of notice to any safety regulations. Some sites are death traps. Well, there is the odd bad apple, perhaps, yes. The odd bad fruit shop, you know. Yes, but it's deregulation the British industry needs, not more regulation. We can't even compete with the Far East. They still have child labour in parts of the Far East. Well, I used to have a little paper round once. It never did me any harm. I mean, in Hong Kong, they can make you a suit in a day. In Britain, it takes them two weeks to realise you're in the shop. People just do not want to work, Gene. There are two and a half million unemployed who do. Ah, well, maybe the people out of work want to work, but the ones in work can't be bothered to do any. But no one appreciates the value of a good worker more than I do. Why, a few years ago, my constituency, a good farm worker was worth almost as much as a sheepdog. And his accommodation was just as comfortable. <laughs> oh, it's health and safety then, is it? Regulation footwear, eh? Hard hats and ear defenders. Where would we be without our Doc Martins? All down the Coropodis with a dodgy toenail. If you mean, am I trying to get better health and safety regulations enforced, then the answer is yes, Norman, I am. Well, you're quite right, Jean. The workplace is a very dangerous environment. I mean, just look at all the germs in here, and they were elected. <laughs> just my joke. You brighten my day, Norman. Well, the thing is, I've had a word with the brothers in the old tall puddles there. The who? The union. Well, it's just mugs of tea, shirt sleeves, high cholesterol sandwiches, nothing fancy. Oh, yes, and what about it? Well, our man in the union wanted me to say, well, not that we uh, are in any way beholden to the unions, I want you to understand that right now, but he wanted me to tell you that they are behind you every inch of the way. Well, every centimetre of the way, now that the stewards have gone metric. <laughs> yes, majority decision, I understand. Where would we be without the unions, though? We'd still all be working an 80-hour week in dreadful conditions, doing soul-destroying labour. I still am, Norman. True, but at least we're not open on Sundays. <laughs> well, now, the Tulls are all very pleased with your proposals, but one or two of the puddles are a bit concerned that too much health and safety could have an effect on pay packet-filling opportunities, curtailing hours workable and such. Oh, yes? Yes. Well, take these proposals here of yours. Now, these new protective masks for paint spray, now, one of the brothers made the point that if he was to wear one of those to protect his lungs while he was spraying, he wouldn't be able to have a fag while he was doing it. I don't care whether he wants a fag or not. My proposals are designed to prevent employers endangering the health and lives of their employees. Yes, well, obviously we all want to protect the union members, but at the same time we don't want to encumber them with unnecessary regulations. Norman, my constituent lost a leg in a totally avoidable accident on a building site. Had he been encumbered by a few unnecessary regulations, he would not now be asking shop assistants if they'd mind splitting a pair of shoes for him. Jean, I think you're just letting your personal involvement slightly colour your judgement here. Now, if I had a constituent who had lost a leg, I, I would be trying to take the more philosophic review. What, that at least you had yours? I just think you're overreacting. All life is a risk. The fact that life is a risk, Norman, doesn't mean that we have to go out and play with razor blades. And safety regulations have always been opposed by the very people they were designed to protect. Safety is all very admirable, Jean, but if you try to impose these regulations, all this red tape could seriously interfere with restrictive trade practices, many of which have been handed down from father to son. There is not much you can do after an accident has happened, but you can try and make sure that it never happens again. And I'm going to make this world a safer place to work in, even if it kills me. I don't know. Women, eh, Harry? Yes. Mind you, my wife's a woman, actually, sir. Oh, I'm not saying there aren't exceptions. So was mine when I first married. But you never really know someone till you live with them, do you?
better for people, safer, cleaner. Do you get any thanks for it? No, no, they just take all the benefits and then go and put their cross in the wrong box. <laughs> so, uh, do you know where this factory is? Oh, well, we'll get a cab or the bus. What, mixed with common people? <laughs> put on your name badge so they'll know what to call you. They might be misled by your face. Thank you, Mummy. It's always men, of course, isn't it? Oh, what's always men? No. Whenever I hear the expression, it's always men, it's always women who are using it. <laughs> and they're the ones who won't wear the protective clothing, who won't take safety precautions. Well, let's not have the unmarried mothers debate all over again, Jean. <laughs> anyway, I don't think it is just men. Have you been in a hairdresser's lately? I had my hair done this morning. Oh. Very nice it looks to you. Well, you will know that these places are full of women assistants killing each other with hairsprays. You know what I mean, Ken. They're afraid their mates will take the mickey out of them. Well, no one likes to wear something that makes them look stupid. But everything we wear looks stupid. It's just we got so used to it, we've forgotten how stupid it is. Look at your suit. Straight off the catwalk, this. So, are we all set for... Oh, look! Three hats! I'm not going to wear that stupid thing. I've just had my head. <laughs> Safety first. I've just come to breaking point, Mrs Price, and I've been to social services and they can't or won't do anything, so I've come to you. Yes, I quite understand. And it may sound cruel, but I never wanted him there in the first place. But after my mother died, he just foisted himself on us and it's been misery ever since. He came round for a cup of tea after the funeral and never went home. Yes, <laughs> relatives can be difficult. It's not just difficult, Mrs Price, he's algebra. I get to screaming point. He's up at five in the morning and spends the next 18 hours asking me what the time is. We hear the same stories over and over. We don't listen to him anymore. We say them along with him. It's like prayers. <laughs> Old people do tend to dwell in the past a bit. I don't mind him dwelling in the past. It's his excursions into the present that get me down. He doesn't seem to realise I've got two children to bring up. Yes, it is the women who usually get lumbered. Oh, you're right there. My brother had nothing to do with him. And he stuck his own mother in a home quick enough. My gran. He had her in the Dun Roman before she'd ever been anywhere. Yes, well, we all get old, I'm afraid. It's either that or die young, which doesn't seem much of an alternative. Yeah, I know. Well, I don't blame him for getting old. And if it was somewhere I could visit him, it might be all right then. We might get on, but he's terrible. I mean, if he was neighbours, you'd sell your house and move. But you can't when he's living in there with you. So has his, um, his mind started to wander? Yeah, but it's not just that. His body started following him. <laughs> he goes like walkabout. The police brought him home yesterday. They found him wandering around quicksave in his pyjamas. Oh, no. Yeah, and he had them on inside out. <laughs> I feel guilty about it, but to be honest, I'd put him in a home tomorrow if I could find one to take him. In fact, I'd stick him in the cattery and the cats would never put up with it. Well, can't the local authority help you with a place in a home? No, they don't want him either. He's on the list, not that I've told him, but it's dead men's dressing gowns around there. <laughs> I frighten myself sometimes, Mrs Price. I feel like giving him such a shaking, like he'll put his teeth in upside down and then complain his gums hurt. Do you, um, shake him? No, no, I'll go upstairs and make the beds or something. Though one day it got so bad, I defrosted a chicken and stabbed it. <laughs> and it's not fair on the children. If I could only get a break, if there was a, a crash I could put him into, or a granny minders or something, if we could just sit and eat a meal without the dreaded anecdotes coming out. Yes, well, look, you just leave it with me then and I'll see what I can do. Oh, well, I wasn't really expecting you to take him, but uh, I could bring him round to your house this afternoon. It wouldn't take long to get him ready. Uh, no, no, actually, what I mean is, why don't you let me ring the social services myself? Oh, yes, all right. Uh, anything you can do, I would be grateful. Where is he at the moment? Can you leave him on his own? Uh, no, I've I brought him with me. He's in the waiting room, keeping your secretary entertained. Yes? Um, Jean, I seem to have been talking to old Mr Greenaway for quite some time now. Will you be much longer? Why? Is he getting worried? No, he isn't. <laughs> Plumber, it's a woman. Uh, yes, I know. You think she knows what she's doing? <laughs> but you wouldn't say that if it was a male plumber. Oh, yes, I would. So how about the compensation? She hasn't even finished the job yet. <laughs> a bit early to start suing her, isn't it? Medical negligence, knees and spleens. You make it sound like a barn dance. <laughs> yes, well, I got the hospital to cough up with the consent form, and it was signed. 
though it definitely wasn't Webb's signature. So I presume someone thought it had been signed, panicked when they found that it hadn't, and then signed it themselves in his name. So they were at fault? Well, bureaucratically, yes. Though it wasn't strictly medical negligence. Arguably, it was even medical diligence. So what should he be after them for? That's what I don't quite understand. Well, I've been thinking about this, and I think the reason that he's angry is because nobody explained to him. That's where the hospital went wrong, where hospitals always go wrong. He's not after them for medical negligence. So what is he after them for? Medical arrogance. I do hope she does know what she's doing. But love, that's what equality means. The right to be equally useless. I just feel numb, really, Mrs. Fries. I, I feel that shock. Yes, well, you were quite right to come round. Oh, um, thank you, Robert. Uh, so what happened? Was it your father? Mm. Yes, thank you. Didn't the social services come round? I did ring them, didn't I, Robert? <laughs> yes, you rang them on Monday twice. What did I say again? You said if they didn't get round there sharpish and do something, you wouldn't just be getting your secretary to ring them up, you'd be ringing them up yourself. <laughs> your tact and discretion, Robert. No, it, it's, it's not that they didn't come round, Mrs Price. So wouldn't they help? Well, no, they agreed it was bad as soon as they saw him. Well, they had to, really. He was sitting there biting holes in his pullover. <laughs> and he found the electric drill again. The social worker agreed he was a danger, especially with two small children in the house. Well, you mustn't feel guilty that they took him into a home. You've done all you could. Especially if he was becoming a danger to the children. But, Mrs Price, they've left him with me. It's the children they've taken into care. <laughs> should have taken the old man away, not the children. I would have thought a critin could see that, let alone a social worker. No, so why didn't they? They can't accommodate him. They haven't got the staff. People don't mind sitting babies on potties. Adults, they're not so keen on. They aren't so winsome. Uh, it's not often you go into a shop and someone says to you, that's a cute little granny you've got there. <laughs> but they can accommodate the children. Oh, yes, they've got them in this child unit in what used to be an old people's home. Oh, another triumph for forward planning, eh? Of course, they get homes for them. Elderly electric drill enthusiasts are harder to place. <laughs> yes, yeah, my adopter driller killer grandpa scheme didn't enjoy the success I envisaged. <laughs> Surely you can find somewhere for him. What about one of the charities? People shouldn't have to go to charities. That sort of help and provision should be theirs by right. I mean, why should that poor woman have to go and ingratiate herself in front of some patronising, smarmy snob? Yeah, quite right. Why should she? She's got you to do it for her. <laughs> and uh, I don't like having to ask anyone for favours, Richard. Uh, especially not you. Yes, I do understand how you feel, Jean. It must be very galling to turn up, cap in hand. Yes, very galling. Is it galling? I do hope it is. Yes, it is. Goody, goody. Anyway, I did hear you say something about an old people's home, so I wondered if it would be possible to, um, pull a few strings. Oh, yes. I'm sure I could tug away at the odd geriatric belfry. I'm a trustee of several charitable organisations that do wonderful work for the old folk. I always try to give them a cherry word when I pop round to boost morale. I'm sure the sight of you, Richard, is the best tonic there is. Yeah, so gratifying to see their wrinkled little faces shining like polished prunes when one appears on the scene. <laughs> I think it makes them feel young again. You're a sort of facelift, are you? Naturally. Anyway, uh, do you think you would have a space in one of these homes or not? Yes, yes, I'll, I'll have a word with the trustees. There may be a bed free, actually, in the main arcane's wing. The main arcane's wing? Yes, it was endowed by a benefactor for elderly economists who've fallen on hard times. Of whom there are so many, of course. <laughs> Only uh, this man hasn't got any money for nursing home fees, you see. Oh, we wouldn't expect him to contribute. Uh, not in the main arcane's wing. No, no, they never have any money in there. <laughs> I'd be very grateful if you could help, Richard. Not at all, Jean, not at all. The poor need our help and patronage, and personally, I'm always delighted to go out and patronise anyone. <laughs> Well, I won. You won? Well, there must be some mistake, surely. That's what I thought. But I checked the small print. Children out of care, elderly party, happily at home in the main arcane's wing. Well, pyjama parties at quick save every weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Mr Webb was clean, £800 better off, and we won the industrial injury. Oh, thank you. You won it? How did you manage that? I thought you said he didn't have a leg to stand on. No, I said he only had one leg to stand on. We appealed and got another doctor to examine him. And this time, he only managed five hops and then he fell flat on his face. We were all very pleased. Oh, yes, you must have been delighted to see him lying there on the floor. Save you buying a rug. Pleased that he was awarded the higher allowance. Mm, how much is it? 
Oh, it would mean another seven or eight pounds a week. Seven or eight pounds a week? That'll make a difference, eh? Be holidays in Bermuda now. Look, I don't set the rates, I just make the claims. I'm not saying it's a lot, but it's better than nothing. Yeah, that's quite true. I mean, that's the job. What can you do, Ken? Little victories, big disappointments. But that's not just politics, that's life. Yeah. You know, Jean, I'm not a religious man, but when the time comes for us to quit this mortal coil... Yes? Assuming there is a God... Yes? Do you think we'll get any compensation? Might do, Ken, but we'll probably have to fight for it. <laughs> Price, isn't it? Uh, yes. Tony called at uh, the Echo. Oh, yes. I I've been appointed lobby correspondent for my paper, Mrs. Price, and I'm just going around making some contacts. Oh, yes. Well, good luck. Nice to have met you. Uh, do you have a moment right now? <laughs> I do, but I already have plans for it. No, it won't take a second. It's just that I understand, Mrs. Price, that you are somewhat against the lobby journalist system. Is that so? Yes, as a matter of fact, it is. Oh, it's interesting, because I'm writing an article at the moment about MPs who... Sorry, what's that? A tape recorder. A tape recorder? <laughs> yes, I've been interviewed before. Oh, right. So, you are no great admirer of the lobby system? No, I prefer direct and open government with full accountability. I think if someone wants to make a statement, they should put their name to it or they shouldn't make it at all. Actually, I agree with you completely there, Mrs. Price. Oh, why? Well, I think ministers and MPs, they abuse the lobby system, don't they? They exploit journalists and use us to fly kites. And then when things don't go their way, they deny everything and the journalists are left there with egg on their faces. Maybe, but journalists sometimes do actually get their facts wrong, Trevor. Tony. Uh, Tony, yes, that's what I meant. <laughs> so if I quote you as being opposed to the lobby system as it stands, that'll be all right, will it? Yeah, I have no objection to that. Though, uh, when you say quote, what do you mean precisely? Well, something like uh, Jean Price, prominent backbench Labour MP, said today, that kind of thing. Yes, it's just I do like to protect my family from, well, you know, you get so many funny letters. Well, um, uh, prominent backbench socialist woman MP. Yes, it's just, um... Woman, I don't see why you should categorise someone's views according to their sex. No, no, fair enough. Let's try a uh, prominent backbench Labour MP spokesman person. Well, hardly <laughs> prominent. Well, backbench Labour MP then? Yes, that's fine. Or even the briefer the better. Sources even. Sources? Yes, if you like. Oh, I see. So I can say that sources in Parliament today agreed that the lobby system of expressing views without accepting accountability for them was being abused. Yes, I think that sounds fine, don't you? Thank you very much for your time, Mrs. Price. Not at all. Don't forget to turn off your tape recorder. Oh, no, thank you. I really must get a tape for it. Bye. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have fobbed him off, Norman. He may have been all right. I mean, he seemed nice enough. Oh, but they all do, Jean. It's part of their job, seeming nice. No sleazeballs they are, journalists. And facts are like bananas to that lot. They never get a straight one. No, that's why I was wary, having had dealings with them before. I mean, they pry into your private life. And if you haven't got one, they make one up for you. Still, I suppose they're necessary evil. There is the matter of the public interest. Or oh, matters of public prurience, more like. No, I'm afraid it's lies that sell newspapers, Jean. And that's where we've been going wrong, you see. We don't have the right caliber of liar in the park. Oh, I don't know. We've got you, Norman. <laughs> We're all politicians are liars to an extent, or we'd never get elected. It's not that we can't tell the occasional porky if it's necessary. It's just the way we tell them nobody believes us. It's technique I'm talking about. Well, I don't know about lying as a matter of deliberate policy. Whereas the other side, I mean, they stand up and tell a pack of lies. Well, you know it's lies. You can see it's lies. But the way they say it, somehow you just have to believe them. Quality liars, that's what they are. Is this something to be proud of? No, not necessarily. But, I mean, you've got to admire professionalism when you see it. 
You got a Tory minister laying his head off at the dispatch box. You can't beat a good job well done. That's why I think we should brush up on our lying, I think. That's why I've organised this little seminar. Can I put your name down for it? What seminar? To brush up on my lying? No, 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 no. Just public relations. There's a difference? Well, I prefer to think of it as getting the policies across myself. Well, now, if you'd excuse me, I got a press briefing. We're launching a new initiative. Who are we? And what does that consist of? Well, mostly the old initiative, but with a change of pants. <laughs> but I've got to be there. I've got to give them the facts. And what are the facts, Norman? I don't know. I haven't made them up yet, but plausible, <laughs> Ian. Plausible. <laughs> it seems to me, Freddie, it's simply a matter of getting the message across. And this is what we're singly failing to do, to get the message across in the media. Yes. You don't have any pims here, do you? Mm. Oh, yes. So, um, what is the message, exactly? Well, let's see now. Uh, there's been a bit of a recession, we can't deny that. Few people unemployed, and no use pretending otherwise. And, of course, the poll tax was an absolute shambles. We have to concede that. In fact, to be honest, Freddie, the simple truth of the matter is... Uh... we've cocked it all up. <laughs> yes, I think that's a pretty fair assessment. But the point you make surely is how much worse things would have been under Labour. Now, that's the point we want to get over. Yes, I see. So you mean some sort of slogan like, vote conservative and be sure of a decent cock-up. <laughs> that's not quite that, exactly. But uh, we certainly imply that had Labour been in power, the country would by now be on its knees. Oh, but I thought you just said that it was. <laughs> anyway, how are we to accomplish all this, Richard? A smear campaign, is it? No, something more surgical than that, I think. Oh, surgical smear campaign. <laughs> Mind, you have to be pretty careful, you know, with these journalists. I mean, you see this interview I gave here. You? You, Freddie, somebody wanted to interview you. Couldn't have been much happening that weekend. <laughs> no, there wasn't. Just the local rag, but you can see how they got everything completely wrong. Mm. I mean, look what they've done to my name. They forgot my hyphens. Oh, that is very serious, Freddie, yes. <laughs> I should take that up with the Press Complaints Commission, if I were you. Oh, is that for me? Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Are you going along, Ken? Hmm? To so what's that? This uh, public relations seminar. No one's organising on their straight to deal the press. No, I already know how to hold up two fingers. Thank you very much. <laughs> Power without responsibility. That's the press. And the broadsheets are just as bad as the tabloids. I mean, quality press says who? Despite you? Yeah, or somebody else operating under the same name. Ken Miller, the Welsh MP. Mm, well, at least they're Celts. It was revealed today has long-standing links with the IRA. I know, I know. Well, where did they get that from? Well, they got it from my entry in Who's Who. See, I'm down as secretary of the IFA, and this is obviously a misprint. So what's the IFA? International Fly Fishing Association. <laughs> Fly fishing? Yeah. It's not the first time, either. Oh, I've been on to them. They say they'll print an apology. They say... You're taking all this remarkably calmly. Yeah, what's keeping me calm, Jean, is thinking of all the flies I'll be able to buy with my out-of-court settlement. So you're not coming to this public relations seminar? Sure you can't be persuaded? No, thank you. Not for me. I'll see you then. OK, and remember, Jean, public relations is a decent and honourable profession run by high-minded people of great integrity. <laughs> it says here. <laughs> so, Jean, so what do you think of the seminar? You feel you've got anything out of it on how to handle the press? I may have done, Norman, though, on the other hand, it's never that clear-cut, is it? Oh, you've got the gist of the message, though, on the tactics of evasion and ambiguity. Yes, I think so, yes. Though, uh, then again, I wouldn't really want to commit myself. You understood how to avoid giving a straight answer to a straight question? Yes, yes, and no. And the technique of turning the question back on the interviewer, because that's quite a tricky one, don't you think? Is it? Why do you ask? No, 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 easy. But you've got about feigning anger and blustering when you're on the spot. Now, look, Norman, I really don't see why I should be subjected to this persistent questioning when I've given up my own time to come here. No, fair enough. But uh, you noted, did you, about delaying tactics? I mean, how to buy yourself time to think when you haven't got a ready answer? Yes, now, I'm glad you asked me that, Norman. I'm sorry, would you repeat that question? Oh, that just about covers it, really. You won't forget, though, will you, about totally ignoring the question you've been asked and answering the one you wanted to be asked instead. Yes, I would like a cup of tea, Norman. Thank you very much. <laughs> Game set an interview, then. So, I think the question we have to ask ourselves, Nigel... Tony. Tony, is uh, how much worse things would have been with uh, another driver at the wheel? Well, I think I could make a very nice little article for someone. Uh, can I quote you on that, Mr Monkton? Quote who, sorry? You, Mr Monkton. Me, on what? What we've just been discussing. Sorry, were we discussing something? Yes, you were just saying how much worse things would have been had a different finger been on the trigger. Oh, yes, yes. Well, uh, what I think you can safely quote me on as saying is that um, 
capitalism is a good thing, socialism is a bad thing, and the party is on course for success. Capitalism is a good thing? Yeah, very good thing, sir. Hardly real news, is it, though, Mr. Monkton? I'm sorry, but if it's real news you want, I'm not putting my name to something like that. I do have my career to consider, after all. <laughs> well, if you don't want to discuss anything for the moment, Mr. Monkton, then... No, I don't think so. No, not really. Well, unless, of course, for human interest, your readers might like to know that my son has got very good marks at school, my daughter's doing well in her music, and my wife and I are extremely happy together. I've got a photograph of the family here, if you care to publish it. Well, as you brought up the subject of your marriage, Mr. Monkton, would you care to comment at all on allegations made by your former secretary at the maternity hospital? I'm sorry, I never discuss my private life. Excuse me. <laughs> I don't know what you thought of him, Jean, this new chap, this latest recruit to the lunchtime of booze club. Well, I was a bit wary to start with. I don't know, he seems all right. Oh, no, don't be fooled, Jean. Best not to drop your guard. They're all smudged with the same bio journalists. They just want to get their hands on your dirty laundry. And let's face it, we've all got some. It's unavoidable. Into each life, a little muck must fall. Yeah, but some lives need more soap powder than others. Well, I don't see that an MP's private life has any bearing on his public affairs, a business. Well, there's a certain legitimate interest. I mean, people might want to know if it's a case of do as I say rather than do as I do. Yes, but you don't expect a vet to swallow his own worming tablets, so why should you expect a politician to follow his own advice? Because I don't think the electorate regard themselves as our patients. They feel that if anyone's sick, it's us. Mm. Oh, why can't you say one thing and do another? And for heaven's sake, if you didn't say one thing and do another, you couldn't bring your children up, let alone run a government. And you know this chap was even intruding into my private life, asking me questions about my son's exam results? Oh, well, that is a bit much, I agree. I mean, I always try to protect my family from unwarranted publicity. Yes, I saw the feature in Hello. But <laughs> the public does have a right to be kept informed. I mean, that's open government. Yes. But if adultery... Petty crime, lies and hypocrisy don't make you unfit to vote. Why should they make you unfit to govern? <laughs> no, it's a bit of community service, that's what they need. Empty a few bedpans, that'll teach them the value of things. Teach who the value of things, Richard? Well, you know, journalists, students, jobs like that. Yes, and the unemployed. In fact, anyone not doing a useful job, I put on compulsory, voluntary community service. Oh, I see. And what about MPs? Us? No, no, we're doing it already. <laughs> You've seen the opinion polls then, have you, Jean? No, I stick to tea leaves, Norman. I think they're more accurate. I think you must be right, because we're up in the Times, down in the Independent, and level pegging to the Telegraph. I haven't been out for the Beano yet. I don't think I could stand the confusion. <laughs> it's odd, isn't it? I mean, I wonder why opinion polls vary so much. Well, it's the public, isn't it? If they could tell a lie to someone with a clipboard, they don't feel the day's been totally wasted. <laughs> you just find a little kite to fly, something that would make things would be worse with Labour disappear into the blue. An angle, you mean? Yes, yeah, just a few degrees, Jean. Yes, little Pythagoras had come in very handy. Don't have an angle, do you? No, I'm all straight lines at the moment, I'm afraid, Norman. Oh, don't sell yourself short, Jean. Oh, to change the subject, I didn't tell you, did I? I was talking to Richard Monkton. Have you heard the latest? He not only wants to bring back the birch... Well, he always did. He's a one-man gardening centre. He now wants to introduce compulsory community service for the unemployed and everyone under 20. Really? He said that to you, did he? Yep, in so many words. Well, that's interesting. No, I quite agree with you, Tony. The lobby system is being completely abused. It's rumour without responsibility. That's what it is. Well, the trouble is, though, Norman, MPs know that I'm against the lobby system, so they feel they can't trust me with the confidence. And can we, Tony, trust you with the confidence? Why, have you got one? Might have. What, something interesting? Could be. Can you tell me? I might do. What terms? Lobby terms. Ah, come on, Norman, give us oh, a chance. Sorry, Tony. I mean, this is a hot potato, this, with a chilli bean filling. <laughs> I mean, I'd love to put my name to it, but it's, I'm not trying to protect myself. i got to think of my sauces and the kiddies. Yeah, all right, Norman. Lobby terms. All right, then, Tony. Not as good as. I hear there's moves in sections of the Tory party. <laughs> Right-wing elements, you know. Right-wing elements, yeah, right. Who are seriously lobbying to introduce compulsory community service. Full time for the unemployed, four days a month for the under 20s. Cheapo labour. Now, come on, Norman, you're joking. They'd never do that. Someone said they'd never get rid of the poll tax. But how? I mean, surely they don't think people will. This could be a bombshell, Norman. I don't think I don't know that. You press blokes are the explosive experts. You're the ones to deal with this. Yeah, right. I don't think they'll run this, though, without any paperwork, but. I could get a line in the diary through. Well, it's entirely up to you, Tony, obviously. I and mean, don't feel pressured in any way. I'm not one to try and influence the press. I just thought you'd like to know us. Huh? Yeah, thanks, Tom. <laughs> but excuse me, I've got a couple of calls to make. Yes, right, oh, Tony. See you. <clears throat> Hello, Norman. What are you 
What are you looking so pleased with yourself for? Oh, Jean, you know that wonderful feeling of satisfaction when there's not a breath of wind about but you manage to get your kite in the air. As they say in the kite shop, flying tonight. <laughs> isn't it? A total smear. A flock of seagulls couldn't have done a more thorough job. I'm afraid I really don't see that, Mr Monk. Well, of course it is. Right-wing elements in the Tory party are bringing pressure to introduce compulsory community service. Well, everyone knows who right-wing elements are. It's me. I'm right-wing elements. I've always been right-wing elements ever since I was knee-high to a ballot box. I'm sure that nobody outside the house makes that association. I'm not concerned with the great unwashed. This will ruin my chances of ever getting into any cabinet. I shall spend the rest of my political life in the sideboard. But it's true, though, isn't it? It is an accurate reflection of your feelings. It doesn't matter whether it is true or not. That is entirely beside the point. Just because something's true doesn't entitle you to print it. Besides, I never confided in you. Where do you get this stuff from? I can't reveal my sources, Mr Monkton. It was given to me on lobby terms. Then the lobby system is being abused. Oh, can I quote you on that? No, you may not. It seems to me that all you journalists want to do is quote other people. Don't you ever have a single original idea of your own? Well, I shall be on to your editor to demand a full retraction. That is your privilege, Mr Monk. It is more than my privilege. It is my right. I'd just like to know who the hell you talk to, that's all. If you'll excuse me, Mr Monkton. Gene Price. Well, I can't see any apology. There, beside the ad for medical support. Talk about equal <laughs> prominence and the right to reply, eh? There you go. <clears throat> oh, yes. The article in last Tuesday's edition, which alleged that Mr. Ken Munster, the West Country MP... Who are? ..had close associations with terrorist organisations, was, we now accept, without foundation, we apologise unreservedly to Mr. Munster, to his family, and his long-time live-in companion, Rupert. <laughs> Who's Rupert? Rupert is my dog, and he's not happy about the implications. <laughs> We regret any distress this may have caused to Mr Munster and apologise unreservedly. Well, you got what you wanted. Yeah, the only trouble is the apology is worse than the original slander. My name isn't mud anymore, it's excrement now, isn't it? What are you going to do? I'm going to get a lawyer and sue. Oh, do you want to talk to my husband? Get him to represent you. Uh, no, thanks, Jean. I'll get a professional. You'd better not say that in front of witnesses. <laughs> I imparted to you my confidence, and my confidence was betrayed. It was nothing of the sort, Richard. I don't go talking to the press about private conversations. I'd hardly expect our pairing arrangement to last on that basis, would I? Well, I can't see anyone on my side of the house betraying a confidence in order to discredit me. Oh, I wouldn't be so sure. Don't forget, it's only your opponents in the opposite party. Your enemies are in your own. <laughs> anyway, it's true, isn't it? You do want compulsory community service. Well, maybe it is true, but that is beside the point. Everyone keeps banging on about the truth as if it excused any sort of bad behaviour. Well, politics is not about truth. Politics is about getting things done. Well, I did not betray your confidence to any journalist, and I did not discuss our private conversation with anyone. Then I shall take your word for that. Apart from Norman. <laughs> I spoke to you in confidence, Norman. Yeah. But how was I to know it was on lobby terms? Because I talked to you in the lobby. No, it was in the tea room. See, I thought it was tea room terms. Hot and sweet. Teaspoon terms, you mean, the way you've been stirring things up? I spoke to that journalist in confidence, Jean. Now, if he's gone and breached it, it's hardly my fault, is it? Well, he ought to be ashamed of himself. Journalists can't be ashamed of themselves. They haven't got the sensitivity. So it was nothing to do with you, Norman? Well, if it was, it was inadvertent. And if news of this unpleasant policy has lost a few hundred thousand votes for the Tories, well, I'm very sorry, but it's nothing to do with me. So you haven't seen today's newspapers, then? On news that right-wing elements were lobbying for compulsory community service, the Tories surged ahead by eight points in the opinion polls. Oh. You see, that's the trouble when you fly kites, Norman. What happens is the wind comes and takes them right out of your hands. Oh, dear. <laughs> of course, I masterminded the whole thing, actually, Freddie. Oh, did you, Richard? Oh, cheers. Yes, a leak here, a morsel there. It all wets the journalistic appetite. Yes, eat anything, some of them. The only thing is... <laughs> of course, I knew it was a vote winner. It looked like a vote loser. But I'm in tune, you see, with popular feeling. I've got my finger on the pulse of the nation, Freddy, the common touch. Yes, only thing is, Richard, uh, as you planned the whole thing so carefully to get all this publicity into Monday's paper... Yes? Why have you retracted it in today's? Why have I what? 
and I shall be under the Commons Privileges Committee about this. I think that's a bit unnecessary, Mr Monkton. Right-wing elements deny they were behind community service moves. That is totally untrue. Right-wing elements were behind it all along. Yes, Mr Monkton, I do realise that. Oh, you realise that, do you? So you admit that you published this denial knowing perfectly well it was completely untrue? But it was your denial. Because when I published the original story, you denied that was true as well. Maybe so, but you still should have checked your facts. But I checked them with you. That is hardly the point. You have deliberately misled the nation. You knew perfectly well there was no truth in my denial, yet, fully aware of that, you chose to go ahead and publish it. In other words, you deliberately lied. But you were onto my editor, Mr Monkton. I see. So one phone call and that's it? The integrity of the press collapses? Sometimes I think you journalists will write anything for a few bob. You don't care whose career you ruin, just so long as you get your story. But you demanded the retraction, Mr Monkton. You said you'd sue if you didn't get it. It's only because it's done you a bit of good in the opinion polls that you've changed your mind. <laughs> if those polls had gone against you, you'd have wanted to keep the retraction in. You journalists are just so cynical, aren't you? Do you see the worst in everyone? I mean, the way you go around portraying sincere, well-meaning politicians as conniving, lying hypocrites. Well, you can't get away with this sort of thing here, you know. Not in this place. This is the House of Commons. The truth means something here. It's in. What's that? Your new apology. Oh, my... It's in? Oh, I didn't think it was going to be until the weekend. Do I get equal prominence? You get equal prominence with embarrassing itching, if that's what you asked for. Oh. <laughs> All right, go on, read it out. Let's see if it uh, has agreed. You agreed on this. Hmm? Apology. Apology. The proprietors fully withdraw all allegations which have appeared in this paper of late concerning the activities of Mr... Kenneth Miller. Kevin Miller. Kevin Miller. <laughs> the Labour MP. A sum of damages has been agreed upon and will be paid to Mr Miller's favourite charity. Cancer Research. The Institute for Study of Sexually Transmitted Diseases. Oh. <laughs> well, there's your apology, Ken. So now what are you going to do? Oh, I'll leave it at that. I think you could say I won that one. You would, would you? Well, for a newspaper, that's almost accurate. <laughs> hello, Tony. Oh, hello, Jean. Is he? No, not really. Oh, good. Um, I was thinking about this lobby system business. Well, I was maybe a bit offhand before, so I just wondered if you want an interview. I'd save it for next week, actually, Jean. Talk to the new bloke. I won't be here. I'm being replaced. Replaced? Why? There's been complaints about me. My style of doing things, apparently. I seem to have got a few people's backs up. Anyway, my editor feels I don't really fit in here, and he's putting me back on the gardening column. Oh, well, I'm sorry it didn't work out. Yeah, me too. Well, more than a bit sorry, I'm, I'm pretty angry, as a matter of fact. Oh? Yeah, you politicians, you do what you want, you say what you like, you ruin people's lives and careers, and you don't even know what you've done, do you? You can't even see it. You twist the truth, manipulate the media, and you're so busy protesting your own innocence, you don't even know who you've trampled on, and you don't even care. Well, I beg your pardon, Tony, but these are not the sort of accusations you can lay at my door. No, I'm sorry, Jean, I mean, there are politicians of quality, but, but some of them, what I call tabloid politicians, I mean, it's anything for a vote with them, isn't it? I'm telling you this, Jean, if a journalist carried on like that, he'd never get away with it. Quite honestly, it's a scandal. <laughs> I do feel bad about it, though. The poor man's losing his job. Why should you? You weren't responsible. It wasn't your fault. Well, I feel I contributed somehow. I mean, I know you get wary about journalists, but he did seem a genuine sort of bloke, really. Well, they all do. That's their stock in trade, isn't it? Plausibility. Oh, journalists, estate agents, Hannibal the cannibal, they're all the same type. Some of them must have integrity. Integrity? A journalist with integrity is like a fish with paws. They're still waiting for it to be invented. <laughs> Well, I'd like to agree with you, but I just feel that this time we did the man an injustice. And to get shunted back to the gardening column. Gardening column? Is that what he used to write? Years ago, yes. He was Green Gingers. You mean fingers? There were a lot of misprints. <laughs> green fingers? Ah, oh, that Tony Calder. Well, I wouldn't trust him farther than I could plant him. He killed my strawberries, you know. Did he now? Yeah. I read his column, followed his advice, Put them out exactly when he said, and the frost killed the lot. Really? I had no idea he'd done that. Yeah, that's journalists for you. They kill your strawberries. <laughs> you try and get an apology out of them. Yeah. Yes, you're right, Jeff. They're all liars. 